Buongiorno a tutti, buon pomeriggio a tutti. Eh, farò questa breve introduzione in italiano, eh, abbiamo una platea più o meno di 50 e 50 tra italiani e stranieri, la stragrande maggioranza delle presentazioni sarà in, in inglese, quindi almeno l'introduzione e qualche altro intervento verrà fatto in italiano. Eh, io sono Luca Boltri, eh, vice direttore di UNIC, con Cerie Italiane, e vi do il benvenuto a questo eh, evento organizzato qua a, a Lina Pelle, eh, che ha come tema la sostenibilità delle, eh, delle materie prime conciarie. Si tratta oramai di una tradizione che abbiamo inaugurato qui a Lina Pelle ormai due anni fa, a ogni edizione eh, organizziamo un evento che tratti uno dei tanti temi che compongono la sostenibilità del, della filiera delle pelli, dell'industria conciaria, del, dell'industria che fornisce le pelli all'industria conciaria e via, e, e via dicendo. Abbiamo affrontato i temi del, della chimica eh, nelle scorse edizioni, i temi del, dell'impronta ambientale della pelle, all'ultima edizione abbiamo parlato di economia circolare, adesso è il momento di parlare della sostenibilità delle, eh, delle materie prime utilizzate dalle, eh, dalle concerie. È un tema particolarmente caldo, è uno dei temi portanti di quello che per noi è la sostenibilità della filiera delle pelli, siamo molto contenti che molti importanti stakeholder della filiera, a partire da chi si occupa di, 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 di macellazione, industria della carne, fino a, ai commercianti e alle concerie abbiano accettato il nostro invito per essere qui e discutere di temi particolarmente caldi come il benessere animale, la tracciabilità, la deforestazione e la qualità del, eh, delle pelli grezze. Questo incontro, eh, questo workshop è organizzato nell'ambito del progetto europeo di dialogo sociale supportato dalla Commissione europea eh, Social Environment e Environmental Reporting 2020 è un progetto appunto coordinato da eh, Cotans a livello europeo con Industrial che è la confederazione che rappresenta i sindacati eh, a livello europeo è un progetto che si concentrerà appunto sulla reportistica e quindi sul dare un'immagine un del, dello status quo in termini di conceria europea quando parliamo di sostenibilità ambientale e sociale e nulla di più pertinente su questo tema, come accennavo prima, è parlare di, eh, di materia prima. Nell'ambito del eh, dialogo sociale sono stati molteplici negli ultimi anni i progetti che hanno toccato questi, questi temi, nel 2012 fu fatto un primo eh, progetto di monitoraggio di quello che è l'impatto ambientale della, della Concilio Europea, abbiamo deciso per quest'anno di riproporlo e di riaggiornarlo con, eh, con, nuovi, eh, con nuovi argomenti. Ehm, essendo appunto un progetto di, del dialogo sociale abbiamo il piacere di vedere coinvolti in maniera attiva anche i sindacati eh, di categoria, sia a livello europeo per quanto riguarda l'attività sviluppata in tale ambito, sia a livello nazionale eh, quando, come in questo caso, organizziamo un, uh, un workshop di questo tipo in Italia. A questo proposito eh, invito sul palco a fare un breve saluto Igor Bonatesta della UIL che eh, porterà i saluti delle tre principali confederazioni sindacali italiane a questo evento. Vi ringrazio e spero che, che l'evento sia di vostro interesse. Grazie mille. Buon pomeriggio a tutti. E nel, il, nostro saluto sarà, il mio saluto sarà breve e a nome di tutte e tre le organizzazioni sindacali italiane. Credo di poter affermare che eh, oggi viviamo in una fase in cui la consapevolezza del mercato e l'attenzione dei cittadini, che poi sono quello che noi comunemente chiamiamo mercato dei nostri, di ciò che viene prodotto in questo, in questo settore, siano sempre più attenti a, a quella che è la tracciabilità, la filiera, la sostenibilità del prodotto che le, nostre, le aziende del nostro territorio, ovviamente di tutta Europa, producono. È per questo che noi come organizzazioni sindacali, ovviamente parlo nel mio caso delle, delle organizzazioni sindacali italiane, abbiamo da anni insieme con l'Unic eh, messo un, un focus molto forte, un'attenzione molto forte sui temi della filiera tutta, dell'approvvigionamento della materia prima, 
e che sappiamo essere come dire, una materia prima che questo settore migliora, recupera, ri, ri, fa ripartire, ricostruisce e rende qualcosa di, di bello, di lusso, di, anche, anche una materia come che diventa lusso se vogliamo. E abbiamo, vi ringraziamo per l'invito e per aver eh, permesso anche a noi di partecipare a questa giornata e crediamo che giornate come queste e momenti come questi siano necessari a fare ancora più chiarezza, a, fare, a mettere ancora maggiore attenzione, maggior luce su quello che è effettivamente il percorso delle, della, de, di chi lavora nella concia, quello che è il percorso di questo, della materia prima che viene conciata, cioè la pelle, eh, in modo che sia più difficile da parte di chi vuole strumentalizzare attaccare un settore che in realtà eh, fa, ripeto, mh, trasforma in un prodotto di elevato livello un qualcosa che altrimenti sarebbe uno scarto quindi vi auguro la, faccio, la chiudo qui perché credo che sia giusto lasciare lo spazio a tutto a quello che è il programma vi auguro un buon lavoro, una buona giornata e credo che questa sia la strada sulla quale dovremo ancora andare avanti grazie mille Io ringrazio Igor perché ha detto una cosa importante che mi ero dimenticato di dire, che è, è l'obiettivo principale di questo incontro. L'obiettivo principale di questo incontro è condividere con voi informazioni reali e veritiere su quello che succede a monte della conceria. Purtroppo eh, è un mondo magari molto lontano dal nostro per certi versi, ed è un mondo su cui magari le persone eh, ottengono informazioni dai media, dai social media, da internet, eh, in, in, informazioni non veritiere, magari veicolate da movimenti di opinione o movimenti etici che portano avanti battaglie appunto di carattere etico, molto spesso battaglie di carattere etico che vengono vendute come battaglie per la sostenibilità, molto spesso nulla è più lontano dalla verità, quindi con questo evento il nostro obiettivo principale è condividere informazioni reali su quello che è lo status quo della filiera a monte, su quelli che sono i progetti in corso e che sono stati sviluppati per il miglioramento comunque di tutta una serie di dinamiche della filiera a monte e quindi potervi dare qualche elemento in più anche per sviluppare le vostre politiche di sostenibilità. Chiudo dicendo, modererà l'incontro Gustavo Gonzales Chicano, che è segretario generale di Cotans e che noi amiamo sfruttare molto spesso per questo tipo di eventi perché è molto bravo. Grazie mille ancora e buon workshop thank you Luca and thank you Unic for organizing this event um, when we see the um, headline raw material actually we don't talk really about the raw material we talk about heights. And when, when we talk about heights, uh, what is the product that we're talking about? This is a product that is available because people like to eat meat, because people like to drink milk. And due to this fact, we have farmers who grow cattle and when the cattle is dying the hide becomes available so instead of throwing the hide away and we have seen just recently pictures in social media uh, about hides that are dumped there is a far better way than dumping the hides but tanning the hides we are transferring something a material which is available We are transferring a material into a product which is sustainable, which is durable, and which fits perfect for customer needs. So when we talk about this material, this hides, the origin is animals, and I think it's important that although we are at the very end of this value chain, um, Animal welfare is an important factor. It's not only something that our customers are asking us, it's also the people 
who work in the industry want to have animal welfare done. And what does animal welfare mean? There are so many, this word is, is used in so many different ways. Um, usually I just say it's the five freedoms that we talk about. We have the freedom of pain. We want to make sure that the animals is treated in a safe way. We have the freedom of the usual behavior. We have the freedom from fear. We have the freedom from thirst and hunger. And we have the freedom from discomfort. So I think these are five things which are important. And although we are at the very end, it is important for us and for our customers. And to make sure that these five freedoms, that animal welfare is followed up, we are talking also about traceability because we want, our customers want to know from where is the leather coming and we want to know from where the hides are coming. So to make sure that in the whole value chain we understand from where the products are coming, we need traceability. And today we are talking about animal welfare, we are talking about traceability, and this is not a nice to have, it's a must. And um, I'm very happy that all the stakeholders, uh, from the meat industry, from the slaughterhouses, traders, um, and the leather industry are collaborating to make sure that we are working perfect together, that these topics are treated in the right way. I would like to thank the delegates for sharing the presentations with us, and I would like to ask Gustavo to make the moderation. And all of you, a very interesting uh, happening t today. Thank you. Now? Does it work? OK. I'm, I'm going to stand up freely here and instead of behind the podium uh, for having a, a more direct contact with the public. Uh, I hope uh, it works. Um, well, leather is a beautiful material. Leather is a marvelous material. It is a unique material. It is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. Every country makes leather. And uh, it is uh, perfect for the purposes that... Uh, uh, our clients, our customers are, are using it. That is uh, clear to most of you because you are visiting a leather fair. Linea Pelle is uh, one of the most important fairs in the world for leather and uh, a fair that brings always the latest novelties in leather production, latest novelties in, in beauty, in, 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 in how you present the product. And here is where you have uh, that innovation that is going to be uh, the, the the material that is going to make your products more more innovative, but um, leather uh, and linea pelle are doing something more this time, because you will have also an exhibition, a s recycling ex exhibition. How here in this fair, uh, you will be able to see how leather works in the circular economy. It is an intrinsically sustainable product because it is intrinsically a product of the circular economy. It is taking up the hides and skins from the meat sector and transforming it into something that exits the food and feed sector and goes into the, the cultural and creative industries, those that most of you are actually representing. And it's a, a particular thing. But not only the intrinsical circularity of the of leather is important, but also that tanners are using up all the material in a valuable way. So and that is happening. That is happening. It is possible. It is possible. And you will be able to see that in the exhibition that is here in Linea Pelle. Now my name is Gustavo Gonzalez Quijano. I am the Secretary General of Cotans, the European 
Leather Industry Association. And I am be the moderator for today. I'm going to try to walk you through uh, this uh, event. And uh, I think that uh, uh, it is uh, time that we start. Now, uh, as uh, my previous speakers have been saying, leather is actually a little bit under attack, under attack from, from many sides, from many uh, angles. And one of the angles is that uh, leather is associated with, uh, uh, well, cruelty to animals. Well, animal welfare is very important for the industry. It is very important for the industry, for the leather industry. Why? Because only well-treated animals produce nice leather and the leather that you, that you get. So it, it makes no sense to make this. But we are here, as uh, Luca was saying, to dispel some of the myth, myths that, uh, that are circulating and to dispel some of the mistruth that are circulating in social media and, and everywhere. And without any further ado, we're going to start with the first uh, session that is dealing with animal welfare. And uh, um, we're going to have uh, the pleasure to listen to a research fellow of the Université degli Studi, Università degli Studi di Milano, Mr. Carlo Tremolada. Um, he is going to give us information, factual information about animal welfare, about how animals are treated in the European Union. Carlo, you have the floor. Buon pomeriggio a tutti. Uh, sono Carlo Tremolada e come appunto gentilmente introdotto sono un ricercatore presso uh, l'Università di Milano. Volevo innanzitutto ringraziare voi per, la, per avermi invitato e per la partecipazione a questo evento ed in particolare anche il gruppo UNIC in quanto uh, questa attività di ricerca è proprio inserita all'interno di un uh, progetto di collaborazione con loro. Uh, la mia presentazione, come potete vedere, vertirà sul benessere animale, benessere animale che uh, oggi è sempre più al centro uh, dell'attenzione dell'opinione pubblica e nonostante si possa pensare al benessere animale come una tematica del, dell'ultimo decennio, in realtà uh, scopriremo che uh, non è così. Però prima di addentrarci e di scoprire insieme quali sono uh, tutte le norme e le leggi che uh, disciplinano il benessere animale all'interno dell'Unione Europea, è importante fare alcune precisazioni in merito alla definizione e al concetto di benessere animale che viene uh, utilizzato oggigiorno. Ripercorrendo, ripercorrendo un po' la storia del benessere animale, Possiamo dire che la prima volta in cui si parla di benessere animale è nel 1964 in Gran Bretagna a seguito di una discussione pubblica sul trattamento degli animali negli allevamenti. Questa discussione prese vita a seguito della pubblicazione del libro che vedete qua, intitolato Animal Machine, dell'autrice inglese uh, Ruth Harrison, la quale per la prima volta portò all'attenzione dell'opinione pubblica uh, le condizioni in cui gli animali venivano allevati all'interno degli allevamenti intensivi. Chiaramente l'uscita di questo libro uh, provocò forti reazioni all'interno uh, nel, nel pubblico nel, a livello di opinione pubblica, tanto da portare lo stesso governo britannico a nominare una specifica commissione il cui compito fu appunto quello di investigare le reali condizioni di vita degli animali all'interno degli allevamenti. Per cui brevemente eh, tale commissione svolse eh, queste attività eh, di investigazione e al termine delle quali concluse che Uh, gli animali sono degli esseri sensibili per cui sono in grado uh, di soffrire uh, a causa delle condizioni in cui vengono allevati. E in secondo luogo sottolineò inoltre come la scienza è un elemento importante e fondamentale proprio per andare a valutare le condizioni di benessere in questi allevamenti intensivi. Al termine di queste indagini venne poi prodotto un report che... Uh, Uh, e vi mostro qui, il uh, cosiddetto Bramber Report e che segnò uh, e diventò il punto di riferimento per tutta la ricerca scientifica che iniziò da questo punto in avanti. 
A seguito del Bramber Report vennero poi uh, definite le famose cinque libertà di cui magari avete già sentito parlare, è appunto la libertà dalla fame e dalla sete, la libertà di vivere in un ambiente confortevole, la libertà uh, dal dolore, dalle ferite e dalle malattie, la libertà di esprimere un comportamento normale e la libertà dalla paura e dal disagio. Ma venendo alla definizione di benessere animale, ehm, dobbiamo fare una breve introduzione in quanto eh, la definizione di benessere animale è cambiata nel corso del tempo, in particolare dal 1965 ad oggi, ed è andata di pari passo agli studi che sono stati condotti in questo campo. Per cui, per definire che cos'è il benessere animale oggi, Uh, un punto di partenza è quello fornito dall'Organizzazione Mondiale della Sanità Animale, la quale appunto definisce il benessere animale come un animale è in grado di adattarsi all'ambiente in cui vive. Inoltre, definisce che un animale è in buono stato di benessere quando è sano, vive in un ambiente confortevole, è ben nutrito e sicuro, è in grado di esprimere il comportamento naturale e se non soffre sotto, uh, situazioni spiacevoli uh, dovute appunto a uh, disagio, uh, dolore e sofferenza. Dopo aver visto qual è il concetto di benessere animale e la sua definizione, possiamo entrare un po' più nel concreto e vedere come il benessere animale è, um, è normato a livello di uh, Unione Europea. Come potete vedere, la prima normativa europea risale a molto tempo fa, per cui al 1974, in cui vi fu la prima normativa relativa alla protezione eh, degli animali durante le fasi di macellazione e da questo momento in avanti poi eh, si eh, svilupparono tutte le altre normative oltre che alle varie iniziative sempre volte alla promozione del benessere animale. Entrando più nello specifico della legislazione europea, il quadro normativo comprende uh, delle leggi cosiddette generali, che sono quelle relative alla stabulazione, al trasporto e alla macellazione di tutti gli animali allevati, ed oltre a questo ha sviluppato anche delle normative cosiddette specifiche, come ad esempio la protezione dei vitelli in allevamento. Entrando più nel dettaglio delle normative generali, uh, queste sono la direttiva, 98, la direttiva 58 del 1958, che è relativa alla protezione degli animali in allevamento, il regolamento 1 del 2005, che è relativo alla protezione uh, durante, degli animali durante il trasporto, e il regolamento 1099 del 2009, che invece è relativo alla protezione degli animali durante l'abbattimento. Per quanto riguarda lo scopo della direttiva 58 è quella di definire delle regole generali per la protezione degli animali, eh, della, per la protezione degli animali allevati, oltre che ad andare ad uniformare l'applicazione della direttiva europea tra tutti gli Stati membri. Alcuni aspetti importanti riguardano il fatto che questa uh, normativa si applica agli animali allevati per la produzione di Uh, cibo, di lana, di pelle e di pelliccia e per tutti gli altri animali allevati per qualsiasi scopo agricolo, comprende per cui anche i pesci, i rettili e gli anfibi. Chiaramente, essendo, uh, eh, essendo proprio per gli animali di allevamento, questa legislazione non si applica agli animali selvatici, agli animali domestici, agli animali impiegati in attività sportive o in eventi culturali, agli animali da sperimentazione e agli invertebrati. Questa diapositiva riassume un po' uh, tutti i requisiti che vengono disciplinati dalla normativa. Ad esempio possiamo vedere che ci sono dei requirement specifici per il personale addetto alla, alla cura degli animali. 
Un altro aspetto importante riguardano le ispezioni, in questo caso eh, qualsiasi animale che eh, viene trovato ammalato eh, all'interno degli allevamenti deve essere prontamente curato e in, in alcuni casi deve essere anche separato dal resto degli animali. Disciplina inoltre la libertà di movimento, la quale appunto deve essere appropriata eh, in base alla specie animale allevata, così come per eh, le sue esigenze etologiche e fisiologiche, e richiede inoltre eh, l'ispezione di quelli che sono eh, tutti i sistemi automatici fondamentali per la vita, de vita dell'animale, come ad esempio eh, i sistemi di abbeverato, i sistemi di alimentazione e così via. Per quanto riguarda invece il regolamento 1 del 2005, lo scopo di questo regolamento è quello di assicurare il benessere eh, degli animali durante tutte le fasi eh, del trasporto, non solo in Unione Europea, ma anche dall'Unione Europea verso Paesi Terzi e viceversa, e questo è un aspetto molto importante. Inoltre definisce eh, chiaramente quali sono le responsabilità di, tutti, eh, di tutte le persone coinvolte nelle eh, varie fasi del trasporto, per cui definisce chiaramente chi è responsabile di cosa ed inoltre determina, eh, determina quali sono gli strumenti di monitoraggio da parte delle autorità competenti che svolgono i controlli. Anche in questo caso, tra gli aspetti più importanti, abbiamo uh, la formazione di tutti gli operatori coinvolti che devono appunto ottenere un certificato che ne attesti le competenze. Uh, ci sono requirement specifici per le pratiche di trasporto e durate massime dove vengono stabiliti uh, gli spazi minimi a seconda delle varie specie animali, eh, oltre che alla durata massima dei trasporti. L'idoneità degli animali al trasporto, in questo caso il regolamento definisce chiaramente tutta una serie di situazioni in cui gli animali non possono essere trasportati, come ad esempio nel caso di animali eh, gravemente feriti o ammalati, ed inoltre contiene tutta una serie di eh, requisiti tecnici che riguardano i mezzi di trasporto. L'ultimo regolamento è quello relativa, relativo alla macellazione, in questo caso l'obiettivo è quello di minimizzare al massimo il dolore e le sofferenze degli animali durante questa fase e anche in questo caso chiaramente un altro obiettivo è quello di uniformare l'applicazione di questo regolamento a livello di tutti gli Stati membri. In particolare questo regolamento si applica anche nei confronti degli stati terzi che vogliono esportare le loro carni in Europa, questo è un aspetto molto importante. Inoltre eh, in ciascun macello deve essere nominato un cosiddetto Animal Welfare Officer il quale è responsabile dell'applicazione di tutte le disposizioni di benessere che sono contenute all'interno del regolamento. Questa diapositiva descrive le quattro principali fasi della macellazione. La prima fase è appunto l'handling, ossia la movimentazione degli animali all'interno del macello dopo che questi vengono scaricati. Il restraining, ossia l'immobilizzazione, che consiste nel contenimento dell'animale in vista poi della fase successiva, ossia dello stunning. La terza fase è lo stunning, ossia Uh, lo stordimento, questo è un requisito molto importante in quanto è obbligatorio in tutti i paesi dell'Unione Europea, fatto salvo nei casi di eh, macellazioni religiose e l'ultima fase è invece il dissanguamento con la quale appunto si porta a morte l'animale. Anche in questo caso ciascuna di queste fasi è disciplinata da uh, precise disposizioni che sono contenute all'interno del Uh, del regolamento, uh, come ad esempio il certificato di competenza di tutti gli operatori che svolgono queste quattro fasi, oltre ad esempio anche i certificati di manutenzione di tutte le attrezzature che vengono utilizzate nelle fasi di macello, come ad esempio nella fase di immobilizzazione degli animali e durante lo standing, uh, come ad esempio la pistola e il proiettile captivo, devono essere uh, mantenuti uh, devono essere sempre sotto manutenzione. 
Per quanto riguarda il livello di enforcement, ossia il livello di applicazione della legge, in questo caso la responsabilità è suddivisa tra, uh, ciascuna, uh, tra ciascuno Stato membro e alla Commissione europea. Per quanto riguarda i compiti uh, di ciascun Stato membro, sono quello di recepire le direttive e i regolamenti all'interno della legislazione nazionale, Inoltre sono responsabili uh, dell'implementation della, uh, della corretta applicazione di queste uh, disposizioni tramite, uh, i, tramite le attività da controllo che vengono effettuate da parte delle autorità competenti. Inoltre ciascun Stato membro è obbligato ogni anno a mandare un report alla Commissione europea uh, in merito a tutte le attività svolte dalle autorità competenti nel corso dei controlli. Dall'altra parte la Commissione europea è invece incaricata e responsabile di fornire informazioni appropriate eh, in merito alla legislazione, di istituire dei corsi dei training specifici, di assicurare la, mh, la corretta applicazione eh, della, di tutte le leggi del benessere animale in ciascun Stato membro e inoltre può prendere azioni contro quegli Stati inadempienti. Come fa a, diciamo, a, a, a raggiungere tutti questi scopi? Attraverso tre meccanismi di azione principale. Il primo sono le ispezioni e controlli. Queste ispezioni e controlli vengono fatte da parte della FIO, eh, che è il Food and Veterinary Office, il quale svolge appunto gli audit per conto della Commissione europea e verifica che all'interno di ogni Stato membro vi sia una corretta applicazione delle disposizioni. Un altro sistema con cui interviene l'Unione Europea sono gli Standing Committee, in particolare l'Unione Europea organizza delle, delle piattaforme nelle quali vengono chiamati i rappresentanti eh, di ogni Stato membro per discutere di tematiche di benessere animali, oltre che per prendere eh, decisioni in caso di eh, emergenze. E l'ultimo modo con cui interviene è attraverso le scientific opinion, ossia tramite i pareri scientifici da parte dell'EFSA, che è la European Food Safety Authority, la quale è incaricata di uh, svolgere gli studi scientifici su tutte le tematiche legate al benessere animale e non solo. Alcuni stati uh, dell'Unione Europea, in particolar modo si tratta di quegli stati in cui eh, prima degli altri il benessere animale diventò eh, oggetto di studio, hanno introdotto alcune eh, leggi specie specifiche per eh, determinate eh, categorie di animali, oppure, un altro esempio, hanno, eh, mh, hanno eh, hanno implementato la loro, uh, la loro legislazione nazionale sul benessere animale oppure hanno uh, degli specifici uh, requirement per quanto riguarda la macellazione senza lo stunning. Inoltre altri stati, uh, sempre facente parte non dell'Unione Europea perché come vedete è compresa anche la Svizzera, uh, hanno diversi requirement per quanto riguarda uh, la durata dei viaggi e la densità degli animali all'interno degli allevamenti. Per quanto riguarda le strategie internazionali intraprese dall'Unione Europea, diciamo che i meccanismi di azione con i quali l'Unione Europea promuove il benessere animale a livello internazionale sono essenzialmente tre. Il primo meccanismo di azione sono le attività multilaterali, il cui obiettivo è la diffusione degli standard di benessere europei in paesi terzi. Questo lo ottiene tramite la collaborazione con l'Organizzazione Mondiale di Sanità Animale, di cui parleremo in seguito, e anche con la FAO. Proprio oggi a Roma vi era un workshop della FAO sul benessere animale. Il secondo modo con cui l'Unione Europea interviene è attraverso la formazione e l'assistenza tecnica. 
In particolar modo l'Unione Europea ha un proprio programma di formazione uh, che si chiama The Better Training for Safer Food e a questo training di formazione partecipano le autorità competenti uh, di tutti i singoli Stati membri. Chiaramente nell'ottica di una collaborazione internazionale uh, la partecipazione a questi eventi di formazione è anche destinata alle autorità competenti che svolgono i controlli nei Paesi terzi. L'ultimo meccanismo di azione con il quale interviene sono le cosiddette attività bilaterali e in questo caso l'Unione Europea inserisce il benessere animale all'interno degli accordi commerciali eh, con determinati paesi e in particolare dal 2002 ci sono accordi bilaterali con il Brasile, l'Argentina, il Cile e la Nuova Zelanda. Nell'ambito appunto della cooperazione internazionale, uh, il ruolo dell'OIE dell che riveste un ruolo molto, uh, molto importante, l'OIE è composto da 181 Stati membri e il suo obiettivo principale è quello di uh, diffondere standard e linee guida inerenti a tematiche uh, di sanità e di salute animale. Nell'ambito della uh, collaborazione con l'Unione Europea uh, si è visto progressivamente nel corso degli anni una progressiva sensibilizzazione uh, fatta da parte dell'Unione Europea sui temi legati al benessere animale, tanto da portare uh, l'OIE ad inserire alcuni requisiti di benessere animale all'interno degli standard che ha prodotto e a oggi ci sono circa 15 standard i quali contengono all'interno queste disposizioni Chiaramente questi standard, uh, ad siccome si applicano in stati uh, magari in via di sviluppo o in stati diversi dall'Europa, uh, non sono così specifici come quelli uh, presenti all'interno della normativa, ma sono dei requirement diciamo, di base a tutela sempre volti alla promozione del benessere animale. Grazie. Thank you, Carlo. Uh, I would like to invite you to sit uh, down here in the, in the panel for maybe there, is, uh, there are questions that are coming up uh, afterwards. Uh, unless there is one very burning question that you would like to ask to, to Carlo immediately, just one? No? Everybody's happy? Understood everything? Well, thank you very much, Carlo. Um, that means that you have well explained uh, the topic. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, it's obvious, you, have, you, you can see that there is quite a lot that is already there. So one may ask um, oneself, well, if there is, there are laws, there are standards, there are uh, rules that are applicable on animal welfare, what is it that it makes that uh, the people are putting things up in the social media? What is the problem? Well. On one hand, you have always one black sheep that is uh, causing the problem in a country. That, that is something that occurs in every sector, but not only in, in animal farming or animal slaughtering, but uh, that should not be the rule. Now, it's not only in the European Union that there are some rules. There are also rules in all the OECD countries and uh, 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 more than in other countries where in developing countries, it is uh, still work in progress, uh, of course. Um, and I would like to invite the people is to, to check where the images that they see, which are very frightening sometimes, where the images come from. And, uh, and make up their mind on their own. Not only on, well, uh, this is something that should stop. And what we see on the internet is something that happens to next uh, uh, to my house. No, no, that's not, uh, that's not the case. We should change the chip in this sense. Now, um, to see that there are also some standards that are applied in other OECD countries, I would like to invite uh, uh, Tiffany Lee, uh, which is, uh, the direct, who is the director of the, <laughs> sorry, of the, the um, research, uh, re regulatory and uh, research uh, uh, affairs in the North American Meat Institute. She is going to give us a, a flair of what is happening in the United States 
and then sit down in the panel with me. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Um, I am going to talk to you about the current recommended animal handling guidelines um, and our audit that we use in the meat industry in the United States. Um, first off though, I want to give you a little bit of a flavor for who the, or what the Meat Institute is. So we are the North American Meat Institute. We represent 95% of the red meat and 70% of the pro turkey processing companies in the US. We also have supplier members and associate members. Um, so we are a, a, you know, we're a big trade association. Um, we have 721 members. I think that is actually increased um, this year uh, with almost 400 packers and processors. Our number one priority at the Meat Institute is food safety. Um, we are a very highly regulated industry. The meat industry is very, very highly regulated. There are inspectors in plants all day, every day, looking at food safety, looking at animal welfare, um, and, and making sure that everyone is following the rules. However, we like to have our members go above and beyond that, and they like to go above and beyond that as well. Uh, so what I do in our regulatory and scientific affairs group is I help our members be in compliance with the current regulations, um, and I help them go above and beyond that, whether it be with food safety, with animal welfare, um, anything uh, along those lines. We have, I am, again, I am part of the regulatory and scientific affairs group. Uh, under that headline, we have uh, animal handling and welfare, and that is my primary focus most of the time. We also have an international affairs group, deals a lot with trade. Uh, my colleague, Stephen, uh, he's gonna be up here talking about traceability uh, in a few minutes. We have a legislative affairs group, uh, which goes to Capitol Hill, talks to Congress. Out of a staff of uh, 34, I believe, we only have two of those people. So we're really focused more on our, keeping our members in compliance and, and helping them improve on the regulatory and scientific front. Um, rather than the lobbying. We have customer outreach and public affairs uh, because you know, you've seen a lot, you know, meat and leather. Uh, they're in the media quite a bit, um, not necessarily in a, a positive light all the time. So I work with them to make sure that everything that we put out to the media is scientifically accurate. We also house a foundation for meat and poultry research. Uh, everything that we do in the meat industry is science-based and that science has to come from somewhere. So we help to fund um, research, mainly in the food safety areas, um, but we also support research in other areas like animal, animal handling and judicious, judicious use of veterinary drugs like antimicrobials. So by trade, I am a veterinarian. Um, I graduated from veterinary school in 2012, and I immediately went to private practice where I worked on, I treated dogs, cats, cattle, pigs, you name it, I worked on it, horses, all of it. Um, and so this is, this is really where I come from. I grew up on a farm. These, these are my people right here. Um, these are some examples of some of my clients. This is Marvin. He uh, was one of my favorite clients because he always, after, after a call, uh, I worked on a horse or cow or something out there, he would always invite me in for cookies and coffee, no matter what, no matter if I was late, he was like, you have to come in and have some coffee. Um, this is Mike. I worked on a lot of his cattle. Um, he is kind of the quintessential American cowboy. He's fantastic. Um, he and his wife, they have us over for dinner all the time. They're, they're great people. And then this guy here, his name is Daryl. He's a pretty big guy. He's tough. He's, he, knows, you know, he knows his cattle. And this is his dog, Tank. I worked on Tank quite a few times. Um, unfortunately, Tank passed away, and I have never, ever seen someone so sad than this guy. And so I want to show you these guys because these are, these are the people who raise cattle in the United States. Now, you know, they're not representative of everyone, but these guys do good work. And I worked with these guys every single day, and I'm very passionate about sharing their story. So, um, however... I did want to go out and do a little bit bigger things with my career, not just stay in a one tiny little town in uh, Colorado. So I went back to school. I got a PhD um, in diagnostic medicine, pathobiology. It's 
big fancy words for um, animal welfare. <laughs> um, so what do I do at the Meat Institute? You know, when we talk about the Meat Institute, we usually talk about animals that are no longer alive. You know, veterinarians are supposed to keep animals alive. Um, so how does that really work, you know? Um, but, you know, there's a lot of things that were taught in veterinary school that really apply to the meat industry nowadays. So my main focus at the Meat Institute is food animal welfare. We have an animal welfare committee that is made up of animal welfare specialists from packers and processors um, all across the country. And so I lead that group uh, as, a, as staff liaison. I also provide technical support for any company that might run into an animal welfare issue. Uh, some of my time is spent dealing with um, judicious use of veterinary drugs, not just antimicrobials, but all kinds of other veterinary drugs that are used, uh, not just in the United States, but in other countries. Use of new technologies, um, I focus a little bit on that, just doing some research in that area. Foreign animal disease is, is a big part of my day uh, nowadays, especially with African swine fever in basically 75% of the, of the world. Um, we want to make sure that the U.S. is prepared um, and willing to, you know, ready to prevent that disease from coming here. And in the end, the Meat Institute, we're, we're there to help our members produce a safe, nutritious, wholesome product. And that's, those are meat products. So part of that is making sure that our members continuously improve on their animal welfare practices. Now, Carlo talked about um, legislation in the EU. We have legislation in the United States. In 1958, uh, Congress passed the Humane, Slaughter, Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, and uh, that is our legislation. Uh, they updated that in 1978. Uh, some examples of, of that legislation include, you know, only taking one shot to effectively stun an animal. You get one shot, and you're done. Um, and so, that really helped to improve animal welfare practices in the 50s, in the 70s. However, times change, right? So we felt, our members felt, that we needed to change with them. So we wanted to take a more systematic approach to animal handling uh, in packing plants. And I just want to remind you, I'm talking animal handling in packing plants. We can talk about live animal, you know, before, um, you know, outside of this, this arena. but. Um, we're going to focus on in-plant today. So in 1991, our members said, we need to do more. We need to go above and beyond the legislation. The leg legislation is great. We need it. But we want to do more. So in 1991, they asked Dr. Temple Grandin, Colorado State University, she's a world-renowned um, animal welfare specialist, to help write a recommended animal handling guidelines document for the meat industry. In 1997, she also helped write a good, man, good management practices document. Um, and those, those two documents, one was kind of a guidelines, one was a little bit more like an audit. And we realized that and we're like, why aren't we doing, why aren't we just doing all of this together? So in 2004, uh, the Meat Institute merged the two documents um, and included the audit. And that document is continuously updated by Temple Grandin and our Animal Welfare Committee. Uh, we just finished a new re revision. Um, it was just released, what, two weeks ago? Um, and if you'd like to see it, I'm happy to share it. Um, but the Animal Welfare Committee really brings, you know, they are packers and processors. They really bring that practicality to the guidelines and to the audit. But we also have academic members and people like Temple who bring the science into it as well. So it's really an all-encompassing document. Um, and I'm, I'm very, very proud of the document that we have right now. Um, and if you have any questions about it, we can, we can go over. I'll go over a little bit of the main concepts here. Again, we updated it in 07, 2012, 15, and 2017. We just updated it. This year as well, it was just released two weeks ago. So there are two parts of the guidelines and the audit. We have one that's focused on transportation from the farm to the packing plant. And then we have the gu guidelines and an audit that's dedicated to the slaughter facility. And we focus everything on outcomes-based measures. We want to measure the outcome 
Now, I don't care if you move animals with, with a flag or you know, with a sort board, that's fine. Your process is okay as long as those animals tell us that they are being handled correctly, right? So with the transportation audit, we review their, the, the company's transportation policy. Is the company prepared to receive animals? We take a look at the setup and the loading of the trailer. Are the compartments gated correctly? Are animals kept, you know, are incompatible animals kept separate? We also look at timeliness of arrival and animal unloading because, you know, you can do everything right, but if you make that truck driver wait with a full load at the packing plant for three hours, that's not good animal welfare. So we take a look at that. that that's huge, especially with pigs. We look at falls. How many animals fall? That's, that's a direct measure of, that's an outcome. You know, we, we measure falls and it can tell us what's going on with the flooring. Maybe the flooring is too slippery. Maybe animal handlers are not doing their job and they're, you know, being crazy and reckless and they're causing the animals to panic and fall. We also measure electric prod use. Uh, we very much discourage the use of electric prods. A lot of our companies actually don't even let truck drivers have an electric prod at all. We also look at the condition of the animal when it comes in. Now, this relates directly back to the farm, and so we can communicate to the farm whether these animals came in in a condition that, that, that is, we consider good animal welfare. If they're some severely emaciated, if there's an, a lot of um, animals dead on arrival, that needs to be communicated back to the farm and something needs to be done about it. And of course, any willful act of abuse, if you take a stick and you hit an animal multiple times, um, if, if you, you know, have a malicious act, you automatically fail an audit. That's just automatic failure. When we look in the slaughter facility, again, we have the willful acts of abuse, that's an immediate failure of the audit. And we have a list in the guidelines of those um, ag willful acts of abuse, not limited to that list, but um, there is a list there. We look at, do the animals have access to water at all times? That's very, very important, especially after they've been transported, you know, five, 10 hours. Again, we look at falls, that tells us a lot about flooring and what the uh, animal's reaction is to the handlers. We look at electric, pro electric prod use as well. Um, again, a lot of our companies have a policy. You don't have an electric prod in your hand. That's not allowed. It has to be set over there, or you just don't have one at all. We also look in the slaughter audit at vocalization, because that is a direct reflection of animal handling. Animals are gonna vocalize if they're not happy. You know, if you're prodding them too hard, or if you're you know, doing something to scare them, that's gonna reflect in the animal's vocalization. So we monitor that and we record it. We also look at effective stunning. You know, the government requires that one shot and that's all you get. We, we make sure that that happens here. And then we also look at bleed rail insensibility because if an animal is hanging and ready to be uh, bled or if it is being bled, you should have no movement, it should be unconscious, there's, there's no question. And if we find that an animal is sensible on the rail, that is also an automatic audit failure. Some people um, you know, are, were a little bit uncomfortable with some of these concepts early on, but we've gotten to the point where we're, we're con continuously improving and people are very, very comfortable with all of these audits. They, they say, yes, of course we meet these. Like, why wouldn't we? And some plants even go above and beyond this. One thing that I want to make sure that I emphasize, we have the North American Meat Institute, and we, along with the Animal Welfare Committee, Temple Grandin, they write the audit, they write the guidelines, right? We have something else called PACO, the Professional Animal Auditor Certification Organization. And that is a third party. It is not associated with the Meat Institute. That is the body that certifies our audit. So, you know, 
the Animal Welfare Committee and Temple Grandin, they go through and they revise the guidelines and say, okay, this is, this is the package that we have. We send it to PACO and they go through it with a fine tooth comb and they certify that yes, this is a legitimate audit and other third parties are able to use that audit when, when auditing slaughter facilities. Um, the uh, PACO also certifies auditors. They train and certify auditors. We don't do that. The Meat Institute does not do that. Obviously that would be a bit of a conflict of interest and we don't want that. Um, so we don't certify auditors. We don't do any of that. PACO does all of that. Um, so it's, it's a nice checks and balances system, I think. Um, so that's kind of our animal welfare standards in a nutshell. Again, I know it's kind of quick and dirty and um, I can share a lot more specific information uh, either here or you know after, after the fact. But um, I also wanna make y'all aware of other industry programs which are farther back than the slaughter facility on, on farm, on the live side. Um, our beef quality assurance, um, that is a beef industry program that has a feed yard assessment. They also certify transporters of, um, of beef animals. And then we also have the United States Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. And that is kind of an up and coming organization that has um, established metrics for all industry sectors. Uh, with anything regarding sustainability, and that's not just animal welfare, that's environmental, um, that's worker safety, things like that. And I can provide the resources uh, for those as well. So, um, do we have time for questions, or should we? One, question. One question? I don't know if we need it. Nobody, nobody. Uh -uh. I I'm guess. going to ask a question when you sit in the Sure, panel. thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Tiffany. Please a, a quick applause for this presentation. Thank you. That was very, very, very uh, clear and, uh, and helpful. Well, uh, this workshop is about sustainability and it is also about partnerships. And I have the big pleasure to introduce you today to uh, Karsten Meyer, who is my counterpart at European level responsible for the livestock and meat sector. Karsten, can you come here? I, I think. That's your presentation. I think you, you can you can speak from directly from from here, and and here's your your thing. So maybe uh, I'll give you here the, the the microphone. Does it work? Not really. So I take okay. yours. Uh, no. Here, now it should work. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> uh, dear Gustavo. Thank you very much um, yeah. for okay. the, this uh, first introduction of uh, partnership. Um, uh, looking to the watch, I think uh, I try to go ahead just explaining what European Organization of Livestock and Meat Trade Union means. In a nutshell, 53 members of the European Union, but also some of the EFTA countries like Switzerland and Norway, and I'm pleased uh, even, I'm not sure if we have the slide yes, for yes, the members. Uh, yeah, um, even uh, associated EU trade partners, uh, which are very important uh, in the meat sector, uh, so uh, Japan, Russia, and Ukraine. We also have uh, associated uh, asso uh, associations, the livestock market, so it's not only livestock, the, the cattle, for example, but also those who organize the markets for them, um, associated and the casing industry specific uh, and uh, sh ship suppliers. Uh, I don't think too, too deep in it. So we uh, represent, that's the most important uh, point uh, to understand a little bit, the construction, a so-called umbrella organization. That means all the national uh, members, um, uh, their president, so to say, um, um, representing in our uh, organization for livestock traders, livestock markets, as I told, is a specific point, and uh, to take it with you, meat industry, slaughterhouses, cutting preparation plants, and the wholesale and international meat traders for what kind? It's cattle and beef, it's horses and horse meat, it's sheep and goats and meat, and of course, pigs and porks, 
representing about 20,000 firms all over uh, Europe, all sizes, and 230,000 jobs. So our theme uh, was not my organization, uh, but animal welfare. And uh, I'm on the, uh, the point um, to say it's everything said, but not for, from everybody, with one exception. The main point um, you told both, the history uh, and the background. And I think that's the only point I want to stress out, because our partnership is not only about animal welfare. We try, uh, say, it, um, from farm to fork, a program from the uh, European Union almost uh, 20 years ago, we tried to start, so to say, from livestock uh, to leather, uh, to explain a little, a little bit more uh, the whole chain. And what is the background, once again, coming back, uh, not only traceability, uh, quality, uh, uh, keywords we can uh, deepen, um, we just wanted to focus about the welfare. What you forgot, no, I, I'm sure you did not forgot, it's so, uh, normal, usual, you don't think about it. Behind it, it's the question of health. It's animal health. And why do I want to stress this out? And I think this is important for the sense of our chain. It's very simple. It's for production. Uh, you stressed out. It's not the household animal. It's not pet. It's uh, animals for use. And to use it, to have uh, efficiency, you need uh, a healthy, complete healthy framework, a healthy uh, animal. And one aspect of health is animal welfare. And I want to stress this out because with a second point, um, very interesting, you stressed uh, the European legislation started, so to say, in uh, 1995. Um, the US uh, got a little bit more 10 years before. When did this animal welfare, this animal health start? 1926, there was one of the first laws about food, about uh, food regulation because of fraud. Ten years later, 1934, and listen, that's my last point, the Nazis implemented the first ever worldwide um, animal welfare uh, regulation because having uh, healthy and uh, efficiency food production. With all the details, the European legislation uh, overtook. This is not nice, I know, but this is the truth. Uh, and that's the background I think we can talk about. Uh, health, it's uh, what us combines and what's the background of uh, animal welfare, animal production. So uh, that's uh, my uh, the proposal uh, for, for some keywords for now and today. I'm looking now that there was just the rest. Okay. Excellent. So let's start. Excellent. Thank you very much, Carsten. That was a very good uh, uh, introduction to our panel. Thank you. Perfect. Um, well, now, we're going to have a, a small dialogue and looking at, uh, at various aspects. Uh, yes, I think this is not any more necessary. We can, yeah. Um, I would like to come back maybe to one of the, the points that have been addressed here. Um, and uh, Carol was uh, making a, a presentation that was very comprehensive, and very, very good. I have, uh, uh, I think that you can Yes, there is nothing to, to, to add or to that. Maybe one, one point uh, I think that uh, was not uh, addressed, which is uh, the question of ritual slaughters. Um, that is uh, 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 an issue at the European level, maybe because it is not, uh, not really uh, regulated um, uh, in depth and uh, that can cause some problems because there are some ritual slaughters in Europe but also elsewhere. So can you tell us uh, something more about ritual slaughter? Uh, what is the difference between ritual slaughter and the normal slaughter and uh, how, how do we manage that? Yes. Uh, the main thing is that uh, 
uh, the stunning is uh, required as a mandatory items uh, in all of the European countries, uh, while the uh, killing of animals uh, without the stunning uh, is uh, only performed by derogation. Uh, so that's uh, the main difference. Uh, of course, uh, uh, in, many, in many countries there are strict regulation about uh, this, uh, uh, this point, but also the, at the European level there are uh, the competent authorities are making a lot of uh, efforts in order to, uh, uh, in order to assess that the, uh, the killing without uh, the stunning is uh, uh, performed in the right way. Uh, but of course, uh, the, the main difference is that uh, the killing without uh, stunning is only by derogation. So uh, that's the point, I think. Right. Uh, okay, well, um, the, 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 the thing is but there are some, some rituals in, in certain uh, religions that yeah. uh, are, are producing quite a lot of, uh, uh, of skins, for instance. Uh, uh, the, 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 for the, in Mo the Muslim community has a yes. ritual slaughter and there are sheep that are, uh, quite a lot of sheep that yes, are. Yes, that's one of uh, the main problem and uh, I think the now the European uh, the European authorities uh, are asking to uh, the slaughterhouse uh, uh, much more information about uh, uh, this practice to kill. So this means that uh, it should be done uh, only in the case if uh, they have the request to uh, to have this kind of uh, slaughtering system. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. That is, uh, uh, you see, there is quite a lot of rules that are out there, but also some exceptions that are, if I'm not wrong, the minority of all the slaughterings that are taking place in, in the community. Fine. Tiffany, <laughs> now to you. How, uh, well, you have been working on animal welfare for quite a lot of time. You have, have enormous successes with, uh, with animal welfare. How do you communicate this information down to the to the to the value chain that is not in the in the in the in the food sector but in rather to in the in in the fashion sector in the creative and cultural sectors? Uh, thank you for the question. And and to be quite honest, we haven't done a very good job of of communicating that. We we just haven't. Um, we haven't done a very good job communicating it to the food sector, let alone. The other sectors that, you know, the Mead Institute isn't necessarily focused on. Now, Steve with the, the leather, hide skin and leather, he's done a good job, but we just, we haven't focused on it and we need to focus on it more. I mean, we've been doing it for 20 years and people are still coming to us saying, what are you doing? And once you show them, they're like, oh, look at all this. But we just haven't done a good job of communicating it to, to basically everyone else outside the industry. And that's really an area that we need to improve upon. Well, you're not the only one. Uh, I mean, uh, the United States is not the only country that is still lacking behind in trying to find some 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 ways of uh, providing transparency along the the value chain of the hide and skin sector. Also in Europe, we have um, we do have traceability, and we do have the possibility to convey this information, but uh, uh, there are still some obstacles uh, that are taking place because we cannot relate, actually, uh, the, 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 the skin to a given uh, situation in, in a given country. Is that the case? So, <laughs> I mean, the, uh, do you know of places where there is uh, the possibility in Europe to convey information about animal welfare uh, uh, outside of the, the, the food sector, the food value chain? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, I tried to get the bridge Tiffany gave me, saying we did not a good job. You are right on the one hand, but why worldwide? because we did not have to do it, because uh, what I tried to show, um, we had to feed the world the last 10, 20, 30 years. Most of us sitting here are the generation uh, without question, but uh, uh, look at our parents. 
they did not have uh, the time or the opportunity or the framework thinking about was it done in a nice way, in a good way, they had to uh, d uh, look to get uh, the, f the, feed, the food. So now we are on the next step. So of course we missed these 10 years to, d to explain. And that's uh, your question now. We uh, have, um, well, uh, to speed up, to, to, to get into this discussion. Uh, or being more involved in this dis discussion. And so uh, a lot of um, uh, partners did that on the uh, uh, worldwide level. You told about the OIE, it's nothing else than uh, having it from the side of the standards worldwide. On the national level, you told, and the European. And what we tried to do just uh, the last, uh, well, it's the last week, so to say, um, with the colleagues from this chain I tried to show, the feed industry, the animal health uh, organization for your, uh, uh, supporting uh, your products, um, the livestock uh, like our organization, the fur industry, the um, leather, but uh, as I showed, uh, we, we representing uh, the, the cattle, uh, pigs, but uh, also, of course, the very big and important, and even in the big discussions, uh, organizations about the poultry involved. Uh, help me, who am I missing? It's uh, more than a dozen, uh, of course, the farmers. <laughs> Sorry, you see, it's the basics. Uh, uh, I should start with them. So uh, we tried. Um, just, uh, we call it the, in the Brussels bubble, for the information around the journalist, of, for the commission services, for the parliament, for the court of auditors, you know, for the 35,000 civil servants, so to say, in the Brussels area, to try to communicate about some uh, fake news uh, and giving them uh, facts and figures. Uh, we called it Meet the Facts, with a little uh, nice uh, word uh, game. Uh, I missed the, the address, but it's worthwhile. It's Meet the Facts, EU, just last week. Launching Hashtag Meet the Facts, Meet like Meet, the meat that we eat, and the facts. So you will, you will fall on a, on a very interesting platform. It's just uh, trying for ex uh, with some myths uh, from the different aspects from, uh, I don't know, what was it for leather? For, for beef, for example, it was, everybody says one kilogram beef needs 15,000 uh, liter water. So the whole discussion about the water footprint, to explain in three words, the, the blue water print, the red, the gray, it needs, needs time. So we said, just uh, focusing what life without livestock, and then taking examples. And then the first example like this, one sentence, differentiate. And then you can dig deeper and start uh, to get into uh, this discussion in two pages on a science based, and that's the last point for me today. Not today, I don't know, but to say, it, once again, we, I think we did not make a real mistake or miss the last 10 years, but what we did was reality. What we tried to do was science-based. We want to be reliable. That needs time, that needs information, that needs the time to discuss. And I sometimes have uh, um, the impression uh, this time we need for reliable discussion isn't given us. It's more the emotional aspect. So in this campaign we tried both. Uh, on the emotional, to catch the eye and then to get deeper. And maybe it's worthwhile to translate in a lot of languages uh, because communication means not only what you say, but what gets to your head. Yeah, no, I, I, I must admit it's a, it's a fantastic repository of, uh, of information, of factual information that is out there. It is for the time being only in English, but I, I, I understand that uh, some of the members of this alliance, because it is a, a very large alliance that is putting together all this information. They are going also to translate it into their languages and at national level and bring out to the people uh, this uh, truth about uh, uh, the livestock sector and about animal welfare and about all these things. One, one thing that I read uh, in, in, in this uh, uh, repository is the fact that actually uh, something that people don't know, maybe 
that one kilogram of nuts consumes more water than one kilogram of meat. It's a, it's a basic thing, but uh, uh, you don't think about that. So it is important that uh, elements like these are conveyed to the general public, and not only to the general public, also to, to politicians that are very, very easily um, emotionally taken by, by other lobbies and, and, and interest groups that are, that are coming into, uh, into contact with them. Oh, yeah, m maybe it, uh, it's even a chance, I hope so a little bit, uh, because uh, about the discussion of region, uh, we are all uh, tackled about, uh, your industry, my organizations, worldwide. Uh, but maybe we can show, if you stop one part of the chain, what about the rest? What about efficiency? You told about that the president uh, started, uh, we tried to have a, a real chain. Stopping this, stopping uh, means, uh, um, what about uh, all the, the next steps missing? And maybe even what are the alternatives for the leather product you started again, the, the, the plastics, the, the, the artificial one. So in the end, I'm hoping, you know, we are all talking about uh, sustainability. This is a, uh, for this nature, what we are repres re represent sounds to me very artificial. What we need is a, a, a pure, is nature, is a natural world, is something what we are, reliable. So maybe we even can change this world, or starting doing that together on the, lit, uh, on the different points of the chain. That's a little bit my hope, and when I see representatives of other countries like Brazil, in this sense, it's the same. The image of the meat, or the leather in the end, that tackles us all. So. Uh, I always said, uh, as uh, the logo from us is, uh, uh, you know, the, the bull with the, the, the lady on. I don't know if uh, anybody realized it's uh, um, the story of uh, uh, Zeus, um, who uh, changed um, uh, and uh, uh, got uh, Europa. So, um, and the, the fiddle taking, it's the sign for harmony. So for me, it's... Uh, the real picture of our uh, world together, and I th think let's tackle the bull by the horns. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, uh, first an applause for, for this panel. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I, we are a little bit behind schedule. I would like to, if there is one question from the floor, I would like to take just one, raise the hands, or remain silent. I think that we should give again to this panel a, a big applause and thank you very much for these presentations. Thank you. Now we, we are passing on now to the, to the point on traceability. Traceability, we have now, we have had uh, uh, animal welfare we, um, animal welfare requires quite a lot of transparency so that uh, the, the truth comes to the public. But um, transparency um, needs also some instruments. And these instruments are traceability, tracking and tracing the, the heights and skins of, uh, of our animals. And for that, we have a, a general presentation of uh, Maurizio Gontu. Maurizio Gontu is the uh, policy officer in the economic department of UNIC, which is the Italian Tennis Association. Uh, some of you will need, know her. Uh, she is a brilliant uh, uh, scientist, a brilliant um, communicator. Maurizia, you have the floor. Grazie, Gustavo, per la presentazione. Io cercherò di essere molto breve. Questo è solo uno speech introduttivo di quella che è la tematica di questa sessione. La tracciabilità, come la definiamo? Quali sono le, 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 le linee guida normative, le metodologie e la documentazione che la definiscono? Che cos'è concettualmente la tracciabilità? È una richiesta di tipo commerciale che deve soddisfare eh, uno scopo etico, cioè quello di garantire un approvvigionamento della materia prima che sia sostenibile. Come definiamo i confini di questo obiettivo, cioè che cosa vogliamo tracciare, quanto vogliamo risalire e in quali modi. Eh, dobbiamo tenere in considerazione 
una serie di, eh, di, 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 di temi, prima di tutto dei temi commerciali, cioè esistono delle, delle supply chain che sono più o meno articolate con molti player che sono coinvolti e che hanno il loro ruolo specifico all'interno e ci sono anche eh, delle tematiche di tipo tecnico, quindi eh, le normative, esistono delle normative obbligatorie, vedremo in che ambiti esistono queste normative obbligatorie e soprattutto quali sono eh, gli strumenti che ci consentono di realizzare effettivamente eh, l'obiettivo della tracciabilità. Partendo un po' dalle basi, vediamo qui che cos'è il ciclo di vita di una pelle. Eh, la pelle grezza è un sottoprodotto di un'attività che è quella della macellazione e che ha come obiettivo principale quello di produrre cibo destinato all'alimentazione umana e poiché la sicurezza dell'alimentazione umana è un obiettivo strategico del legislatore effettivamente esiste una normativa molto stretta in ambito di tracciabilità ma solamente per quanto riguarda la catena alimentare lo stesso non si può dire per quanto riguarda la pelle, però vedremo che questa è una base di partenza. Quindi qual è, quali sono le informazioni, qual è la documentazione che accompagna una pelle grezza? Allora facciamo una distinzione, se è una pelle prodotta in ambito europeo, esiste un documento commerciale che accompagna la eh, partita di pelle e che contiene informazioni merceologiche oltre alle informazioni sanitarie. Se invece si tratta di un'importazione in Europa, eh, le procedure di sdoganamento richiedono la presenza di un veterinario che eh, si collega al database europeo Traces, che è quel database che racchiude le informazioni su tutti gli operatori che sono autorizzati al, al commercio eh, di eh, carne e sottoprodotti e quindi controlla che ci sia una corrispondenza di codici rispetto alla documentazione di quello che entra nel territorio europeo eh, con quello che è stato autorizzato. E anche qui ci sono delle informazioni eh, importanti su, mh, di tipo merceologico, quali sono, eh, il, qual è il paese d'origine, il macello di provenienza e le informazioni sanitarie. Eh, per le informazioni sanitarie, qua l'ho specificato, intendo se eh, il, il grezzo in questione è classificato in categoria A, quindi eh, nell'ambito di, di un sistema circolare viene poi eh, destinato alla produzione per esempio di gelatine o collagene, oppure se è destinato ad altri eh, utilizzi tecnici che quindi non hanno eh, niente a che vedere con un consumo umano diretto. Procediamo lungo la catena del valore e eh, vediamo che qua ci sono i primi step intermedi. Di, in, in relazione a quanto è frammentata la catena del valore, esiste un primo passaggio di informazioni che può essere più o meno completo, e questo appunto dipende da quanto è eh, frammentata e quanti operatori sono eh, presenti all'interno di, di questa fase. Dopo aver visto le informazioni e le normative, vediamo quali sono gli strumenti che consentono la tracciabilità. Abbiamo visto la documentazione, eh, abbiamo visto eh, che questa documentazione può essere accompagnata da diversi, diverse tipologie di identificazione, tag, etichette e altri segni distintivi. L'evoluzione tecnologica in questo ambito è continua perché siamo sempre alla ricerca di nuove soluzioni eh, per consentire il passaggio di informazioni, un passaggio di informazione efficace, però eh, anche qua ci scontriamo con alcuni ostacoli. Eh, le condizioni che questi strumenti dovrebbero eh, rispettare sono quello di non essere facilmente eh, separabile dalla pelle che accompagnano, che non siano manipolabili a scopi diciamo, fraudolenti e Uh, ovviamente last but not least, uh, non danneggiare uh, la qualità della materia prima. Torniamo alle domande che ci siamo posti all'inizio. Quindi, quali risposte ci possiamo dare? È possibile identificare uh, l'origine uh, della partita di grezzo fino, e anche qua dipende dalla frammentazione della catena, fino al, uh, al macello, attraverso un sistema di documenti o un altro sistema di identificazione eh, applicato. Ci piace? Quanto ci garantisce questo? Beh, è sicuramente un, un ottimo set di informazioni 
che può essere messo in relazione ad altre informazioni importanti quali quelle sull'animal welfare, quindi agli aspetti etici eh, della fornitura che noi vogliamo, vogliamo insomma, tracciare e garantire. Vogliamo qualcosa di più perché siamo sempre alla ricerca di un miglioramento, quindi in che modo? Ci sono delle, ovviamente delle sfide da, uh, da fronteggiare. Uh, nel caso di uh, ulteriori informazioni risalendo sempre più in alto, rispetto, sempre più a monte diciamo, della, uh, della catena del valore, è chiaramente necessario avere un coinvolgimento attivo dei fornitori perché questa mh, trasmissione di informazioni effettivamente si realizzi in un contesto in cui, ricordiamo, non esiste un obbligo di legge che, eh, che lo definisca. E eh, vogliamo più dettaglio rispetto all'identificazione di un lotto di pelle? Chiaramente qua bisogna, eh, bisogna continuare a fare ricerca in ambito tecnologico eh, per trovare strumenti che effettivamente ci consentano di realizzare questo obiettivo mantenendo le condizioni che abbiamo già, eh, già detto, quindi di eh, non essere manipolabili e di consentire la conservazione della qualità del, eh, del prodotto. L'ho lasciato alla fine perché in realtà questo è il vero, il vero, eh, la vera sfida, cioè l'obiettivo che, eh, che la sostenibilità del, della supply chain eh, si pone è mh, quello di condividere informazioni confidenziali, quindi sostanzialmente eh, sembrerebbe quasi una contraddizione in termini, però una strada per realizzare questo obiettivo potrebbe essere l'intervento di terze parti che consentano da un lato la garanzia della confidenzialità insieme al raggiungimento dell'obiettivo di conoscere queste informazioni che garantiscano la sostenibilità della, della fornitura. Ho concluso, <ride> facendo più in fretta possibile. Grazie. Grazie, grazie mille. Thank you very much Maurizia for, for this uh, introductory speech. Now we are going to have uh, uh, a panel again where I'm going to, to ask uh, one by one of the panelists to, to come up to the floor and to present us their own experiences. And uh, to start with, I, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Michael Sondergaard from uh, Scanheit to come up uh, to the floor and uh, uh, either... And, uh, well, are you going to make a presentation of Scanheit? Should I say something? Okay, so you, you will do it much better than me. No, not sure. First of all, thank you for having me. My name is Michael Sondergaard. I'm the CEO of Scanhide. I'm new into this business, into leather business. I'm actually five months into it, and you, some of you think, why did I move into the leather business? Um, <laughs> uh, it's pretty difficult times. Uh, I came from the food business. I've been in food for 25 years. Uh, I can just say that the grass is not green on the other side. We're in food, we also have our challenges. But maybe in food, we have been 15, 20 years ahead of the leather business because we are somehow closer to the consumers within food. Um, and traceability is, uh, is transparency. Uh, and uh, I can look at uh, and in Alka as well. If you go down in a supermarket and you pick up some beef, within half an hour, I'm pretty sure they can tell you where that beef came from even though it's been cut into pieces. So uh, when I started at Scanhead and asked about, um, if I can get this to work, sorry, uh, pointing. When I started there, I said, so uh, can we do mass balance and trace it back? I said, what do you mean? Customers don't want that. Our consumers don't want that. Have we asked them? And they just say no. I said, let's do that because traceability is also where we can take cost and control cost internally in our factory. It's not only something that security and in the brilliant presentation we just heard about how it works, it's also how you control your process inter internally in your factory. And what you got here, and it might be a little bit brutal, but that's a earmark from a, from a Danish cow actually that we put on a Danish chair. And over here, which you can't see, we will have the whole life story of that animal. Uh, where it's been raised, where it's been born, It, it, it's, its mother, everything, has it had any antibiotics, so it's the full well, welfare story. Sorry, we got here in that chair. So who are Scanhide? We are a Danish cattle abattoir owned by farmers, um, predominantly. Um, and then uh, we got raw material supply from Denmark, Sweden, and northern Germany. 
uh, and the farmers owns the, own the company, so it's a cooperative, uh, which somehow makes it easier because, um, or the avatars own, own, own Scanhide, so it makes it a little bit easier also the way we can work down in, the, in, in our supply chain um, because we've got different controls as we don't have to go out and buy the material. But we've got a very strict uh, supply code of conduct, not only in Scanhide, but also for all the abattoirs that they have to sign up to. And you heard the whole thing about animal welfare. That is absolute follow in our, our chain all the way through. And it's something that's been worked on all the time to improve, um, because I'm pretty sure that's also a journey. The, the, the facts that we got, we do fresh, we do salt, and we do wet blue and wet white. It's LGV gold with, I'm told, 95.3% uh, points, and that's apparently okay. Uh, so we're proud of that. Um, and then, yeah, we got this full traceability of every single hide back to birth. Uh, our challenge has been, oh, yeah, we can say, we can we, we scan hide this from farm to sofa to handbag, any, any leather goods. But our challenge has been that when, when you go into wet blue or wet white, the traceability really stops because we, we haven't figured out how can we keep the earmarks or the tags on the height because the chemical that we are using is just getting uh, the, the marks to disappear or they will create a scratch in, um, on the height and lower the quality. So um, we've been looking at what can we do. And just to, to set the scene in Denmark and in Scandinavia how it works, every animal has got two air tags. One is digital, one is uh, analog and uh, everything has to be registered. And the Danish system is, I think, particular because you have to nearly register this thing before the animal has been born. Uh, it is extremely strict. If you don't do that, you can't raise it on your farm. Uh, so there is control by the, the ministry. You have, the farmer has to register it there. And it's the same goes for Sweden, actually. Um, and that means we get the full upbring. Uh, what goes on on farm, how many times has it been moved to any farms, different farm, uh, and it's full life. And then when it gets to the abattoir, it will be registered there, they will, they will, they will tag the hide, uh, and they will do all the markings, whatever has to be, has to happen there, so we still have full trace. And then when it gets to, to scan hide, uh, we sort of said, uh, how do we pair this? Uh, and uh, we've been around, but we came up with a laser technology. So that means within a few weeks' time, all our heights would be marked with a number. Also on the wet blue and the wet white, it'll, 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 it'll do in fresh, and then when you put it into wet white or wet blue, you, the number will, this is from a wet blue, it looks like that, so it's readable. That also means that our customers can use it in their take chain because the number won't disappear, and we could put two or three numbers on each height if necessary. Uh, and it's, it is to give the security of where it's from and give the full story. Uh, and I sincerely believe there is a commercial value towards our end consumers that today are asking for more and more information. This could be a solution. So it will give you the, the traceability after the tanning process. And uh, that means scan height from, uh, from farm to sofa. So it all begins with this, with the animal, and we all know about meals and all that, and we all have a big responsibility in this chain because it is extremely complicated. It's, it, it, it is not just the height. There are so many other factors that are playing into this. And one thing we have said as a company, and we are part of the Danish Crown Group as well, which is one of the, the larger abattoirs in Europe, is that we have committed ourselves to these UN new principles uh, and the 17 world, uh, go uh, goals, world goals, um, which we will be hardly committed our ourselves to going forward and work with in the factory and with our partners. Uh, but by doing that, and 17 is actually partnership, I think this is sort of really important and, and complement for arranging this thing as well, because we need partnership to create transparency in the value chain. We all need to step up and cooperate across the value chain. Scanhai can't do it on our own, and I'm pretty sure you guys can't do it on our own. We have to come to the table and work together. So um, that's what we have committed ourselves to and what we're ready to. So uh, we're just saying from farm to shoe to handbag, and then we want to create a more transparent future 
within the, the leather business so we can get leather back with a positive story and not all these uh, negative things that you hear. It's a natural product. It's something that's been for many, many years and it should be here for many, many years going forward. Uh, so uh, that's all of Scanhard and what we do. Applause. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, please stay, stay with me here on the, on the panel. Now from, from Denmark, we are going to, to go to Italy to another very important reality in the, in the beef sector. It's uh, the Cremonini group in Alca is uh, uh, probably the most important uh, uh, group in the, in, in the beef sector. Marco Cardinelli. Uh, 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 Canzerli, can, can <laughs> excuse me, uh, um, are going to, is going to, to make us a presentation about how they implement traceability in their operations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gustav. Um, buongiorno a tutti. My name is Marco. Let's like keep it uh, that. Uh, it was most difficult. Thank you, for, thank you all for being in Milan. Welcome to Milan and being here. And thanks to Lina Pellet for the opportunity. Um, so, in a nutshell, uh, Cremonini Group uh, was born in 1963. Uh, major activity still nowadays is uh, in Alca, which stands for uh, stands for uh, meat uh, uh, food industry, right? Uh, can I keep in hold of this? Uh, we also have other activities, which are distribution and uh, catering. Uh, so we have control from uh, from the, uh, how can I stop this, sorry. Mauricio. Come si fa a mettere pausa? Dovrebbe andare tranquillo. No, vada sola, ok, automatico. Non capisco. Così va da sola? Proviamo a vederla così? That's fine. Non so, perché onestamente non so per quale motivo parte in automatico. Thank you. Thank you, Maurizio. So we are the leading company in Italy for uh, meat packing. Um, the turnover of the group is over 4 billion, 4 billion euros. Uh, half of it comes from the meat industry. Uh, the rest is catering. We have uh, chain restaurants, um, restaurant chain, sorry, and uh, we have uh, also distribution. So millions of people is with us every day, uh, maybe billions. Um, the slaughtering figures are 700,000 animals per year. That, that means 700,000 hides as well. Uh, we farm um, 150. 150,000 animals in our own farms. Um, and um, majorly, uh, we have also control, we audit uh, all different suppliers besides our own farms. And uh, let's say that uh, the biggest parts of our, of our, uh, our raw material comes from uh, uh, farms that belong to consortium, quite important uh, for the production of cheese. Uh, Grana Padano and uh, uh, Parmigiano Reggiano, the king of them. Uh, so there's a strict control on uh, on uh, feed and uh, animal welfare handling and etc. So the model of Inalca is to um, have control on everything, as I've uh, heard, from farm to fork, from farm to tannery, from farm to products, etc. We also have control on the feed because the animals grown uh, uh, reared and bred in our farms are fed with products that comes 99%, I guess, from our own uh, fields. Um, yes, yeah, so it's an integrated, integrated control and uh, it guarantees uh, controls and accessibility uh, through the whole chain. We also, so we meet, you are meat processors, we prepare food, and we distribute that to, um, to Italian and uh, uh, European and worldwide. 50% of our 
uh, turnover is made abroad. Uh, whether we talk about beef, also whether we talk about fish or vegetables, if you are vegetarians or uh, anything. Breeding, uh, within a radius of 200 kilometers from our slaughtering plant, uh, we can reach the 84% of Italian cattle production. That means, that means the radius uh, gives, um, grants, grants the animals uh, a short journey, a short journey to the, uh, to the slaughterhouse, to the abattoir, uh, which translates into into welfare, less suffering, and uh, and uh, a best product. We have, uh, as I mentioned before, our own farms. We uh, rear, um, I think nowadays, one one thousand fifty one hundred and fifty thousand, or even more animals. Uh, basically, steers, heifers, and uh, calves. This is the last investment we have made a couple of years ago. Uh, you landed the Savoia in a single single uh, farm. We uh, rear um, ten thousand steers and heifers per year. So uh, hide comes from beef uh, as along uh, along other products. So beef is our main and major business. Um, but besides from that, uh, we consider the we consider bovine as a generous animal. Uh, so it gives us beef, and it also gives us a fifth quarter. That's what is called in the um, behind the scenes. That means it gives hides for the leather business and everything that uh, we all know here. It also provides uh, different articles, fats using cosmetic and chemicals and uh, feed industry. And uh, blood for the fertilizers, for uh, chemical industry, for the pharmaceutical industry, cartilage for uh, the same, bones the same, uh, gelatin and collagen. Uh, we have uh, uh, a stomach, the fourth stomach, the bonosome, which is utilized for the production of, uh, that's called rennet, for the production of uh, uh, the cheese industry. Uh, to, agulate, to coagulate milk, uh, the most important cheese I mentioned before. Uh, by uh, they need they need uh, in order to 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 be DOP, so protected origin, uh, defined protected origin. They need to use a natural natural rennet uh, pericardium, something that goes into the uh, medical devices. Quality and safety, uh, again, traceability. We run in total per year 140,000 checks. So there are 365 days per year, to remind you. We run 140,000 checks on traceability. The same goes for highs. So with the system we have put in place to give traceability back to the uh, to the animal, back to the farm, and all the history is the same apply. The same system is applied. The same model applies to hides. So every single hide is marked with a tag, and every single every single expedition, every single pallet, every single uh, sales of hides is uh, is. Um, Accompanied by the documents, which lists all animals, all farms, and uh, traders and uh, collectors in between, and the uh, slaughterhouse where it comes from. So we cooperate along the major, the major uh, uh, team and control and committees uh, in Italy to have control, to develop, to also to, uh, to increase our quality. Um, from the intervention I heard it before, the most important thing that emerged, it was passion. Passion is the drive for us, as it is for the others in the sectors. So uh, what our aim is to work every day with passion, to enjoy what we do. Uh, to do that, you have to, to Always be on the piece and always be ahead of the rest and try try to be try to be innovative. 
five freedoms I've mentioned before, so I don't go through that. Sustainability. Uh, our model consists in to have uh, an integrated supply chain to reduce a reduction of waste, uh, all of that. We have water treatment, uh, water treatment facilities. We produce our own energies. Uh, I don't go through numbers, that's vanity. Uh, reduction of uh, CO2, uh, waste recycling, um, uh, all of that. Let's say, uh, just one thing, we have, uh, we tend to, tend to have, our aim is to have our, our uh, meat processing plant 100% uh, sustainable in terms of energies. So that's all. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here for the opportunity. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Ganzelli. Please uh, uh, take a seat also here in the, in the panel. And now that we have seen a best practice that exists in, in the European Union, we're crossing the borders. And uh, I have the pleasure to introduce you to Jean-Pierre Van Kruyse. He, he has a Belgian name or a Flemish name, but he is coming, he's representing uh, Australia actually the uh, casino group and uh, which is better known as the northern uh, northern cooperative meat company in australia is this correct sorry you are representing a uh, casino which is the better known as the northern um, cooperative meat company correct and they have the tannery cht which the casino tannery part of the slaughterhouse okay Perfect. Are you going to make a better introduction, a, a, a further introduction? Yes. Okay. So then you have the floor. Thank you very much. I mean, the, since they unfortunately couldn't come to the event, no, they have authorized me to represent and try to explain quickly how the traceability system works in Australia. So having a very short time available, I try to reassume as much as possible the system in place in Australia and the livestock identification and traceability. Few facts, few facts about Australia. Australia is a continent which has an area of 7.5 million square kilometer. The population of Australia is 25 million people. The cattle herd is 26.6 million head the beef industry employs about 1% of the population in Australia. Yearly production of red meat, beef and veal is 2.5 million tonnes of carcass. The gross value of cattle and veal per year is 16.8 billion, which is 90% of total farm value and 1.26% of the GDP of Australia. And there are about 35,000 farms in Australia. History of traceability in Australia. The first traceability system was introduced in Australia in the 60s. This was done to assist the brucellosis and tuberculosis eradication campaign. In 1999, Australia was the first country to introduce a national livestock identification system. system. In 2009, this was then expanded to sheep and goats. NLIS has been endorsed by all major producers, feedlots, sale yards and abattoirs. The national livestock identification system requires three elements to enable lifetime traceability of animals. By law, all animals must have a computer chip placed in their ear when they leave their farm of birth. An animal identifier, ear tag or bolus. Identification of physical location through a property identification code the PIC. PIC are issued by the State Department of Primary Industry of Agriculture. The NLIS Web Accessible Database to monitor the information and movement of individual animals. The NLIS 
is required to facilitate traceability in accordance to the national traceability and performance standards. The importance of NLIS in Australia. As mentioned earlier, around 200,000 people are involved in the meat industry. Australia is free from most agriculture and aquatic pest and boasts of a clean and green reputation around the world. 74% of the domestic production of red meat is export in over 100 countries. In case of a life epidemic disease or chemical residue incident, a full traceability system allows quickly to get ahead of the issue and reduce final and social impact. Other benefits of the supply chain. Aside of traceability, NLIS is being used as a tool for data collection, analysis of the data from all members of the supply chain, breeders, feedlots, sale yards, and abattoirs. As allowed this business to maximize the productivity by identify non-performing animals or breeds, allowing to identify production capacity in different uh, paddocks, and ultimately helping the meat market specifications. How does it work? The NLIS has a national database and provides for free the device which is given to the producer and breeder who must tag the animal at the moment of birth. When the breeder will then sell the animal to the sale yard, they must report to the, data, the central database. The sale yard will do the same, the feedlot again, and the abattoir will do the same. So that on the database, all the information of the whole life of the animal is recorded. NLRS, animal welfare. In addition to the full traceability in case of disease, the Australian government has also taken measure to ensure the good practice by all individual in the beef supply chain. This is monitored by a Livestock Production Assurance Program, LPA. It's an independent audited on-farm assurance program covering food safety, animal welfare, and biosecurity. The LPA provide an evidence of livestock history and on-farm practice when transferring livestock through the value chain. Once the animal arrives at the abattoir, it has the tag from NLIS. At the moment of kill, that tag will be taken off the animal and replaced by the slaughterhouse and casino internal code. That internal code will then follow the animal carcass through the food production process. The same reference code is also embossed on each hide, making both the grain and the split identifiable by the number. These world-class system utilize several unique Australian on and off farm system to guarantee the CHT brand maintains its place and guarantee of the quality. Modern computer system coupled with CHT unique identification numbering allows the opportunity for CHT to provide its customers with the data and complete traceability of the wet blue hides, grains, and drop splits. As an example of the high traceability, 
if a customer were to quote the palette number a hide was on and the hide number CHT would be able to provide the full data back through to the slaughterhouse with the drum the hide was stand and the subsequent process controls. To conclude, there is no need to say that indeed the whole system is much more articulated and complicated than how I have just resumed. In any case, if you will be interested to have more precise information regarding the Australian system and procedure, you're welcome to contact me and I will direct you to the people in Australia who will be happy to assist you to the best of their ability. Thank you very much for your assistance and wish you all a successful fair. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Pierre. Please have a seat here in the panel. And now, uh, last but not least, uh, uh, our US colleague, Stefan Southman. He is president of the United States uh, Council for Hide Skins and Leather Traders Association but uh, that is going to change name as of next year. It's going to be the Leather and Hyde, Leather and Hyde Council of America. So. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Stephen, you have the floor. Um, nothing. Thank you, Gustavo. I appreciate that. So I will just very quickly uh, describe the Hides and Skins Traceability Program in the, uh, in the U.S. that we have actually just announced as of last week. So chances are the vast majority of you have not heard of this yet, um, and that's why. So uh, we are in a little bit of a different situation in the U.S. than a lot of other countries you've heard from today because we do not have a national animal traceability program uh, going from the farm forward. So. Uh, this is this is historical and cultural for many reasons in our country, and it also relates to our governing system. Um, our federal government versus our state-based governments uh, have a push and pull in terms of our regulatory system, and so uh, our federal government cannot always go in and, and regulate uh, these issues as easily as central governments can in other countries. Uh, it also relates back to a little bit of the Old West uh, American cowboy days as well. So there's a lot of cultural heritage there related to um, ranchers who do not like people from Washington, D.C. telling them how to raise their animals. So uh, from this is what we've inherited in, as in, in the industry, and therefore we don't have an ability to also have a hides and skins traceability program that would relate to some sort of national program as well. Uh, however, we do have some programs in the industry. There, there is a large, large one that's uh, known as the Animal Disease Traceability System. This is a federal program that can cover any animal that does tr cross states, cross state lines. Then it became a federal jurisdiction animal. So there are, there are a number of systems out there. But again, we have no mandatory system the way other countries do. So what that has left is uh, industry really trying to figure out how to trace these hides as best they can and as far as they can and plug these holes where, uh, where we, we have regulatory holes. Uh, so individual companies have done quite a lot of work on this. Um, some of you may be aware of, of, of some of those programs if, if you're working with specific suppliers from the U.S. However, uh, we in the association decided that uh, that probably wasn't enough, that it got to be time that we wanted to cover as much of, if not all of the entire uh, U.S. hides and skins supply under some sort of traceability program uh, to be responsive to what the market was telling us. So what we have done is, uh, is developed this program, which its goal is to certify 100% uh, of U.S. hides and skins back to some point of origin. Now I say some, it's very capitalized on the presentation because it may not be the meat packer where it originated. Um, we know that, it's just the reality of the situation. Luca mentioned that early in the, uh, early in the presentation that we, th this is just a presentation about what is the reality in the market. So this is what we are working with. Um, it, but what it does is provide quite a bit of flexibility um, under the program so that for companies that have invested quite a bit in traceability, they can uh, certify their material no problem under this. And it also brings a whole lot of material into the program that previously had no traceable certification whatsoever. You had to just take a supplier's word for it that I say my hide came from here and uh, you had to believe them. So what this uh, program seeks to do is pr get all of that material under one uh, one certification scheme um, and provide assurance to our customers. So uh, 
the most important part of this program, and I'll describe the program briefly in a minute, but the most important this part of this program is it is independently audited and certified by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, a, an agency within there called the Agricultural Marketing Service, AMS. Uh, this is important because uh, this actually allows us to certify and audit this system um, using government resources, and it's quite cheap for the industry as well. Um, AMS already has over 600 auditors uh, that are government employees spread out across the United States. Um, and so what we're able to util do by utilizing those resources is uh, cut down on the cost of uh, certifying traceability for our individual uh, plants and members. So under the uh, our traceability system, there are what we call two plus one levels of traceability, essentially. Uh, the first uh, protocol level is, is the easiest one to understand. It's, it's traceable hides and skins back to the meat packer. Um, obviously, that's one that's, that's very simple to understand. But the second one would be our processor protocol. And so this is because in our industry, we do have quite a lot of centralized or regionalized processors who collect hides from a number of different packing plants in the area. And they put them together, they mix them, and that's how they process them for their own business reasons. They've been doing it that way. So that's the reality of how our, our industry is set up. And so we do want to make sure we capture those hides and certify them from a point of origin. So we call it two plus one, though, because we do have a hybrid protocol available as well. And this is for processors who are collecting hides from however many packing plants who are able to say, OK, well, this section of hides, I may not be able to trace back to specific packers, but these sections of hides, I definitely can. And so we wanted to make a, a mechanism for them to be able to say, OK, well, then these are meat packer certified hides. They're, you can certify they're traceable back to the meat packer. So I'll just briefly discuss each one just uh, to explain how they work. I think some of them are, are pretty uh, self-explanatory. The meatpacker protocol definitely is. Um, and so it's just if a, uh, AMS, a USDA AMS auditor comes in, the meatpacker shows them how they are, uh, they are uh, processing their hides and tracing those hides through their packing plant and then how they're shipping those out to the tanner. Uh, in the U.S. industry, a lot of our meat packers have hide processing facilities and wet blue facilities on site. So this is a very easy uh, audit for the auditor because they say, are there any other hides coming from anywhere else besides the packing plant on site? The packing plant says no. They provide uh, documentation or other means of, uh, of evidence for that. And uh, they're, they're, they are audited and they are approved. Uh, it gets a lot more complicated, obviously, with the processor system. So uh, in this system, we have obviously have a uh, centralized processor who's collecting from a number of different meat packers. I've put only three, three packers up here, there, but usually this is 30, 40, 50, 60 meat packers they will be collecting from. So uh, they have not had an economic incentive to necessarily keep those, uh, those hides in the past separated. So um, what they are doing, though, is processing them at a central location, usually in a geographical region where the meat packer um, is located. And so under the processor protocol, the USDA AMS uh, auditor will certify that hides coming from that processing facility are traceable to there. Um, and again, this, we, we, this is an important part of our system because this ensures that 100% of US hides and skins can be traceable back to a point in the, uh, in the supply chain. It's also imp important to note that there's a lot of hides and skins that are produced not via the meat, meat packer uh, facilities. Uh, it might be animals that died of natural causes. It might be animals that uh, were not able to be processed for one reason or another into the food supply chain, so they never actually made it into a meat packer. We still do not want to lose those hides and skins uh, as, a, as a natural resource. So this, uh, this protocol ensures that they are traceable back to a certain point. Now, again, I, I mentioned the hybrid protocol. This is where it gets a little bit uh, more difficult, but this is also where I think there's a lot of opportunities, especially as traceability becomes more important to our downstream customers. Um, if you do have a processor who's collecting from a number of different packers, um, and they are able to show within their own system um, the ability to identify, segregate, and, and uh, process hides from one meat packer uh, separately or a couple meat packers separately, uh, then the hides that they have mixed together, then they are eligible to be certified for both under the both both systems. So for these uh, for these these uh, processing houses, uh, their their traceability system with internally is going to look a little bit more complex than a meat packers would necessarily, uh, but it does allow them to then tap into 
um, uh, again, a traceable system that brings them all the way back to the meatpacker where they're able to do that. I should note, um, I, I might have not mentioned this before, we do not prescribe a specific um, system be used for traceability internally. What, what we require under this program is that this, whatever system the facility is using for traceability, they have to justify it and prove it to the external auditor that it, it works. So they can use a stamping system, they can use a you know, physical identification system as we've seen several examples of, uh, or it could be a paper-based um, system and, and segregation within the plant. So the companies are free to use any system they want, um, but again, they, they have to certify that and, and prove that it's justified uh, to, to reinforce their claims about um, traceability. So, and then th this is where I think uh, the, the program becomes valuable for our downstream customers is uh, once a facility has been approved as traceable on, under any of the protocols, uh, they will receive uh, certification from USDA. Uh, their certification uh, will be posted on a U.S. government website saying that they have been certified, uh, where the plant is located, and to what protocol they have been certified under. Uh, we will also list that same information on our association website um, and make it very available for, obviously, our downstream customers. Um, and then we will also issue certificates of traceability or certificates of origin uh, for facilities that have been uh, approved under these systems as well. Those certificates can travel with the hides to our downstream customers, and our downstream customers can verify that those hides have actually been sourced from those facilities that are traceable by looking it up on a U.S. government website. So that's a very short, very quick summary of the program. It's brand new, um, so we are still uh, working through a number of issues in its launch. However, we're very excited about it, and we think it's going to be a very good thing for our customers and our industry. So happy to take any questions at any point. OK, thank you very much, Stefan. That was uh, excellent. Uh, but uh, when one sees all these presentations, uh, uh, one uh, must come to the conclusion that uh, there is quite a lot of thing out there. Um, what is the the problem? Why do we have still so many requests from our brands, from our customers, that uh, they want to have more traceability? They want to have traceability at all? Um, of course, you are those that have. Uh, in place the best practice and so there are much more uh, producers of items skins although probably here we have uh, one of the biggest uh, concentrations of uh, bovine heights producers uh, that one can ever have in 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 a meeting like that so i'm very very proud of that i'm a little bit impressed um what is your i, I make a, an open question to the to the panel and so you you can take the floor uh, and respond so what is your understanding about uh, what is missing? Where is the, what is the, 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 the problem? Um, is it the question of uh, transparency? Uh, because, uh, well, why do we have to pro provide uh, uh, traceability if at the end uh, the brands are not being really transparent about what they have? Uh, is it about cost because uh, uh, it requires something that is uh, to be paid back so to every part of the to every link in the supply chain to have it uh, uh, paid or is it about uh, um, confidentiality that uh, you don't want to know where I'm going to get my heights from otherwise you you are going to bypass my and uh, doing something like that or uh, or is it about the how well, up to what point is it possible to trace and where do the problems start? Um, just food for thought and uh, so you, you can pick up on each of these questions or each of these uh, points and, and, and address them. So who wants to start? I, yeah, thank you, Gustav. I'll just start with, with one point of it from, from my perspective, and that's been what's, what, what, what has been the reason it's been so difficult to implement some of these systems. And from the U.S.'s uh, perspective, I would say it's, it's a, a factor of cost versus economic incentive. And, and I think that's been the key for us. You know, the technology has been out there for years, and, and to do this, at least from the packing level forward, you know, for us it gets more difficult on the live animal side. But 
uh, I have several member companies who would say, yeah, you know, if I get paid X number of dollars per head, you know, per hide more, then of course I'm going to uh, invest in a, in a marking system or something along those lines. But they just haven't seen that um, that economic incentive, and and some of the costs of these systems can be very high. So they've had to try to justify them um, one way or another. So I think that that's at least for historically that might be changing, but historically that has been a, a roadblock to adoption. It's sort of a very open question <laughs> uh, and, and very broad, but I think the whole thing about climate change, what we do for the climate, and if we then look at all our young consumers, they want to know more. We all got the internet, we all, by the way, traced because the phones know where we are. And, and, and I just think it's the, 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 the timing now is there where people want to know more about the products they're buying, not only leather. It's everything that we do. We want to we know the story if it's, if it's textile, if it's our food. So I think we are becoming, with technology, we want to know more and more. And, and somehow we have to raise the bar uh, and respond to the young consumers. Uh, because the older ones maybe are not so interested in this, but all the young ones, if I look at my kids, they all want to know where does it come from, what's the story? And I think they're, they're, that's where we've got a, a, some, form, some sort of a responsibility to start to create that. So for me, it's not only about, it, this will cost as well, but we can only take cost out by working together, and then I don't think it'll be that costly. If you look at the British retailers and their private label concept, they started 20 years ago. That was why traceability came in as well. In the UK, particularly, Tesco and M&S and Waitrose were the, the ones pioneer for that. And they, they, they did for, for many, many reasons. But to give consumer confidence in what they were buying, there was a history. So, but I think it's a very, very broad topic today compared to 10 years ago. Uh, thank you, Michael. Yes, Gustav, I think, I think uh, my point of being here and uh, uh, the request for me being here was that I'd like to, to, shorten the, to shorten the distance that there is between uh, our group, our, uh, this, kind of pro uh, this kind of professional uh, business, so meat packers or farmers or, or uh, collectors, to shorten the distance to, to the end consumer of leather, of eyes. Uh, that that be done through uh, the automotive business uh, involved the people in, uh, involved in the automotive business uh, directly, uh, the fashion, the fashion groups, etc. Just to understand, to make people understand what we, what they're wearing, what they're driving, what they are uh, handling each day, each and every day. Uh, this is not something synthetic. It's something co that comes naturally, naturally from the beginning of the of the world. Uh, so it's being uh, utilized, uh, and that gives. That gives her an, an honor to, let's, let's put it this way, let's give, it gives an honor to, uh, to our job and to the life of those animals we treat every day. Yeah. Yep. Well, even though I'm not Australian, <laughs> but since they asked me to, to, to talk on their behalf, I think that at the end it was implemented in Australia because they had a problem with the disease and therefore to tackle that problem and support the industry and the food industry locally and export, at the moment they found the system and it becomes law. It makes it quite simple. It's not an individual thing, it's a, a law for the whole country. So I don't understand very well how other countries do not apply because I don't believe it's really a question of cost is actually a saving of the cost for the whole industry because to have a database and an ear tag cannot be a huge cost. Now, of course, the next question is the whole industry required to everybody who is on, the, on our side of the industry the whole traceability. How come that question is not required to the customer who buy the leather? Where is the traceability once you buy the car, once you buy a pair of shoes? So why does it have to go to a point and do not follow on the next one? Okay. 
Thank you. Now, I think that this is a question that we will have to, to ask uh, maybe at the next Linear Pelle, where we will have uh, probably here a number of brands that are going to be explaining why they are so eager to get the, this information and then are not necessarily transparent with this information and providing this information to the public or to the, to the consumers. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure that they are not uh, willing to do so because I've heard some, some of the big brands that want to have traceability organized uh, in, their, in their supply chain up to uh, the, each individual animal by 2020 or something like that. So I, I, I think that there, there, there must be something more about that because if you are publicizing that, that means also that you are going to uh, explain it, what it is to the public. But it's true, we have to, to think about uh, traceability and transparency are two different concepts and traceability exists. It is possible. It is not necessarily more expensive. There are some front runners that we have here in this panel, but uh, that can be implemented also in all, all over the sector. And uh, I would say we, we had a, a, a private meeting before this uh, workshop, and uh, um, I am pretty happy that uh, uh, we are likely to, to be able to have as an objective to, to become much more traceable and much more transparent in the future. So I think that uh, 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 we should be giving now the floor to, to the public. If there is any question that want to be raised, we have there, Stefan. Thank you, Gustavo. My name is Steven Tierney. I work for a magazine called World Leather. Michael, and anyone else who wants to comment, what is the extra value that you can add if you trace as far as you're talking about? You, you said that your children want to know the story behind the product, and I accept that that's true. But if you know that the animal came from the European Union or from Italy or from the United States or from Australia, where the regulations are in place and are enforced, and you can tell from that 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 animal lived with the five freedoms, why isn't that enough? What, what is the extra value that derives from the extra information? That's a good question. First of all, my kids, they've been told to, interest, to be interested in leather going forward because that's where we're bringing home the bacon. Uh, um, but there, there, there is no doubt that when you add a, what, what you can do here with full traceability is you can add a story. Uh, and then it, the question is, do you want to use it commercially or not? Uh, we, we just want to offer it as a possibility to, to offer it commercially to, to certain brands that can go out and say, we, as you mentioned, 2020, somebody said, we want to have full traceability. We want to provide the solution. We want to be part of that. And we know it's going to be a roller coaster on that way because m mistakes will be made. But there is definitely a need for certain brands that are willing to take and go the, 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 this extra mile uh, to, 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 to open up the supply chain and work across different sectors. Because I have to say I respect, uh, we sit at the bottom of, 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 sort of, uh, of this tree and we are not going to need to talk to the consumers. Our customers are going to do that. But I am three, four steps away from that. So somehow I need to make sure that we get people on the journey to that we all have the common interest in about creating a sustainable, uh, taking a, a sustainable product and making sure that our consumers also get that uh, compared to vegan leather and whatever alternatives that's out there. So, so for me, it's more about starting that journey. That's what we want in Scanheim wants to do and find some partners uh, and then to get a look at what value can, can be created. Hope that answers the question. If I can add something to, to what uh, has been said, is that we put in place traceability to, to grant and to, and to give uh, customers uh, safety and quality about our meat. Okay? It derives, so when you know what you are offering, what you are providing your customer, uh, you know that you are providing something that is not harmless for them, is not uh, uh, a danger, it doesn't, doesn't put in 
doesn't jeopardize his, his health, etc. Uh, that does not apply to highs, as you mentioned, as, as you want to point out. But uh, it goes with if you if you are certain, if you if you work, you build up. If you build up something with your suppliers, with your life cuts or suppliers, uh, that goes uh, the same quality, the same principles applies to leather as well, to the highs. So we give a traceability uh, with the highs that it gives uh, the, the final customer uh, an ethical uh, use, an ethical, um, um, uh, let's say, an ethical answer to what he's wearing, or as I mentioned before, what he's got in his hands. Excellent. Uh, any other question? We are going to take just one more, if it is uh, possible. If not, we will invite you to a big applause to this panel, and thank you very much to all of you. Now we are, we are, we are going to go from uh, the traceability, the best practice that is made by actually the meat packers, those that are producing the, the meat and the hides, two certification systems that exist in the leather sector. And I would like to call to uh, the floor three people, three persons, uh, very important persons. Um, on one hand, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Well, ladies first, uh, uh, Sabrina Frontini, who is, who is the director of the Italian Institute for Certification of the Leather Sector. Uh, Deborah Taylor, Director of uh, uh, the Leather Working Group, and uh, Rafael Andrade, who is the representative of the Brazilian Leather Sustainability Certification. And I want to ask you to be a big welcome, a big applause to, to these three panelists. Each of them is going to have about five minutes for making a presentation, and then we're going to have a, a common question that is going to be to be uh, asked to to all of them so well since we have uh, ladies first now we're giving the floor to a man a man that comes from brazil yes <laughs> and is going to entertain us uh, with uh, some so. <laughs> brazilian not with my jet lag <laughs> well okay uh thank you so much for the invitation we have been uh, working in the leather industry for so long, many of the faces here are well known. But I'd like to give you a glimpse of the Brazilian certification on sustainability. And it's really a short brief because there are so many actions that we have been doing over the years and partnerships, but we will go round to that after this panel and we're going to be able to talk a little bit more about that. Um, so what is CSCB? Uh, some, sometimes it's hard to pronounce outside Brazil. Uh, we say it's CSCB. It's the Brazilian certification for, uh, for the leather industry. It was created by the leather industry for the leather, leather industry. And the most important thing, it's not a protocol. It's a certification. It's audited by third parties. And it was created because the industry itself started uh, asking for a Brazilian certification that was uh, in compliance with the regulations, not only from Brazil, but international regulations uh, from all over the world. Why is that? Because the tanneries, the Brazilian tanneries, are very well internationalized. Most of the, the letters are exported, so that's why it was created, to fulfill this need for, for the tanneries. And this execution, this auditing, is executed by third parties that are related to the Brazilian National Metrology Institute in Metro. So it's a completely uh, third party certification. They, they go through a pro process of uh, understanding, understanding uh, what are the KPIs, what are the goals, the checkpoints that they have to do. And they work under that, and then they are audited. So it's a, a complete and very strong certification. Uh, and it has four dimensions. It comes from economic, because the tenery must be able to fulfill all its economic needs. Uh, it also comes from environmental, all the sustainability part environmental. It goes also from the social part, 
the people, how the people are treated, if they have the right conditions, and also the sustainability management, how the tannery works, the, all these aspects inside the tannery. So these are the four dimensions. So it's a complete certification uh, that we have in Brazil. Uh, some of the hierarchical structure that we have, but instead of going in specifics, one of the most important things that happened uh, uh, last year, we've been discussing uh, international partnerships and how to make this program better, right? Because it was created in Brazil, but the tenaries are all international. Uh, one thing that is really good for everyone to understand, 70% uh, of the Brazilian cattle herd, with this the biggest commercial cattle herd in the world, are outside of the Amazon biome. So the tanneries are located, most of the finished uh, leather tanneries are located outside the Amazon biome. And we are always working on ways to improve certification and improve the quality of the work that we are doing. And we spent about a year and a go, Sabrina, uh, a year and a half, I believe so. Uh, we have a partnership, an agreement partnership with ECEC from Italy. We spent about a year and a half uh, going back and forth uh, on the certifications, trying to understand if the certifications were equal on the basis uh, on how to certify the, the tanneries. And after a long, long, very long process, we were able, uh, we made our due diligence regarding that, and after that we, we were able to create this uh, mutual recognition agreement that we signed last year in Hong Kong. And what that means, it means that the Italian tanneries that have ECEC are respected in Brazil as if they do have uh, CSCB, and the tanneries that have CSCB are as well respected in Italy as they would have ECEC. So we use that as a form of, of gain momentum, of gain strength between our certifications, and it's a very due, due diligence process. And the way that the certification works, besides all the, all the specifics, I, mean, I see a lot of similarities regarding uh, traceability and things that Stephen and Maurizia uh, very, uh, very gladly, very happily, uh, uh, they put here about how it works. We do have uh, on that part in CSCB, but we also work very strongly in order to create these international partnerships. Because we believe that we are not alone. We need help. We need to be together with all the international partners. Because that's the only way for the leather sector in the world, with all the difficulties that we're facing, that's the only fa uh, way how to create progress in the sector. So we just had a meeting before this, this panel. And I think this kind of meetings where we set some KPIs, some ways of going forward, ways of achieving something for the, for the sector is very important. And also information. That's why I highlighted information. I think that we all should be together in a way to spread this good information to the general public. I always say that sometimes I'm tired of only speaking, speaking to the people that already knows about ladder, right? And there's so many youngsters that don't even have a clue about uh, all the, the good things about ladder, how renewable comes from a renewable source, um, has this cognitive bias against ladder because it's something so old that their grandparents uh, used to tell them, we need to change that. We need to get these good practices and we need to pass on this information to the next generation. Um, it's a really quick brief. I'm going to be here with, uh, with all of them, and after that, we're going to have a round table, so you're going to be able to ask some questions. Okay, thank you so much. Di nuovo buon pomeriggio a tutti, grazie per l'invito ad essere qui, io riprendo il mio discorso in italiano, quindi siamo tutti più tranquilli, almeno <ride> per chi è italiano come me. Allora, eh, il nostro lavoro di istituto di certificazione inizia eh, da 25 anni fa 
e vorrei sottolineare che siamo specializzati soltanto per, per l'area pelle, quindi ICEC non lavora come molti altri enti di certificazione per tutti i settori, ma solo nel, nel settore della pelle. Abbiamo l'accreditamento Accredia, che è l'ente nazionale di accreditamento di tutti gli organismi di certificazione. Questo è molto importante perché nel nostro settore significa anche garantire competenza nel fare gli, le, le ispezioni, imparzialità e assenza di conflitti di interesse. Le nostre certificazioni sono di tipo volontario, è importante anche questo, e di terzo tipo, quindi significa che noi non poniamo nessun obbligo ai nostri clienti di fare questi tipi di certificazioni, ma sono assolutamente liberi di scegliere eh, quali schemi fare e con chi farli. E poi ovviamente anche l'audit di terzo tipo garantisce la riservatezza delle informazioni che noi andiamo a visionare durante gli audit. Non è un affare eh, indifferente questa questione, come si è detto prima, perché la trasparenza non è sempre dovuta, quindi anche quando si fa tracciabilità, eh, anche se si raccolgono i dati, molto spesso è difficile averli perché c'è una sorta di protezionismo di tutte queste informazioni da parte di tutta la supply chain. Perché abbiamo fatto degli schemi di tracciabilità nostri come ICEC eh, e non ci siamo basati su qualcos'altro? Perché eh, abbiamo fatto prima di tutto un check e a livello normativo standard ISO Uh, Uni o EN, quindi a livello internazionale o nazionale europeo, non c'erano, c'erano soltanto per il settore food, quindi praticamente dal 2012 abbiamo creato degli standard proprietari e privati per la certificazione della tracciabilità nel settore pelle. Queste certificazioni hanno validità di un anno, vengono svolte ogni anno in azienda e la durata minima delle ispezioni è di mezza giornata, quindi sono molto specifici, approfonditi e eh, si focalizza l'attenzione durante l'audit solo sulla tracciabilità. Ovviamente noi eroghiamo anche altri schemi di certificazione, ma non è questo il momento di, di elencarli. Per le concerie ci sono due schemi di certificazione, 410 e 12, con la differenza che l'uno si focalizza su un insieme più ampio di, di articoli che possono essere analizzati, è una certificazione di prodotto e in questo caso non si verifica la modalità con cui l'azienda tiene poi tracciate le pelli all'interno della sua produzione. Questo non significa che l'azienda non lo fa e ci tengo a sottolinearlo, significa solo che in questo schema noi non lo andiamo a controllare, mentre nell'altro schema che è il 412 ci si focalizza su un prodotto o più articoli più specifici con delle origini più particolari e in questo caso si va a controllare all'interno dell'azienda anche come questo tipo di produzione viene mantenuta separata da tutto il resto degli articoli prodotti. Per i brands c'è anche la possibilità di applicare lo schema 414 che è una specifica tecnica attraverso cui si possono tracciare le fasi di produzione del manufatto, quindi dell'articolo finito in pelle. I punti chiave di questi schemi è che si vanno a tracciare appunto le materie prime, le pelli, non altri tipi di acquisti, quindi non si tracciano i prodotti chimici, sono schemi applicabili a tutte le tipologie di aziende di qualsiasi dimensione, qualsiasi tipo, per qualsiasi tipologia di materia prima acquistata, sia materia prima grezza che semilavorata e eh, non dipende eh, la certificazione nemmeno da quali e quante fasi l'azienda svolge, quindi si può tranquillamente applicare anche ad aziende che producono wet blue come ad aziende che fanno prodotti eh, pelli finite. Um, Fino ad ora, l'ho sottolineato, noi con questa certificazione non abbiamo avuto l'intenzione di dare, eh, creare delle blacklist, quindi di dire che certe origini sono meglio di altre. Sottolineo fino ad ora, perché poi vedremo nello sviluppo anche delle prossime panel e domande, eh, ci saranno degli sviluppi, cioè non ci si può fermare soltanto a dare un rating, a fare una fotografia oggettiva di quello che succede, ma bisogna iniziare a ragionare sui temi dell'animal welfare o della deforestazione per fare delle integrazioni e dell'analisi di rischio su queste tematiche della tracciabilità. Quindi ci saranno degli sviluppi. Gli schemi molto velocemente si compongono da una parte di sistemi di gestione 
più una mappa Excel attraverso cui andiamo a mappare tutti gli ordini di acquisto di un certo articolo che si vuole certificare per ben 12 mesi a partire eh, retroattivi rispetto alla data in cui si svolge l'audit. Eh, è molto importante durante questi controlli fare anche la verifica della conformità legislativa come in tutti gli schemi di certificazione e in tutto quello che noi andiamo a controllare non si accettano mai le sole autodichiarazioni delle aziende vogliamo sempre che ci sia la documentazione a supporto di quello che viene verificato se non addirittura tracciabilità fisica o comunque altri tipi di supporti che non siano le mere parole del conciatore che ci viene a raccontare quello che secondo lui succede a casa sua. Quindi tutto quello che verifichiamo deve essere documentato. E se non va bene, le non conformità fanno calare il punteggio finale che daremo all'azienda su questa, tramite questa attestazione. Quindi noi andiamo attraverso la mappa, questo magari non si vede molto chiaramente, ma è giusto per far vedere che c'è un foglio Excel di lavoro attraverso cui si raccolgono i dati relativi ai paesi e ai luoghi di macellazione, ai paesi e ai luoghi di origine delle materie prime, si assegna un punteggio ponderato e si arriva alla fine a determinare un rating assegnato a queste aziende che stabilisce qual è il grado di controllo che loro hanno sulla supply chain in termini di quantità delle informazioni che sono state in grado di reperire sui propri fornitori, sulle proprie materie prime acquistate, quindi si possono o non si possono avere informazioni fino ai paesi o ai luoghi di macellazione, fino ai paesi o ai luoghi di allevamento. Una precisazione, per paesi si intendono le nazioni e per luoghi i nomi invece degli stabilimenti o di abbattimento o di allevamento degli animali. Abbiamo fatto un incontro oggi di tracciabilità senza forse chiarire cosa vuol dire origine delle materie prime, l'origine per noi è il paese, la nazione e poi il luogo dove avviene l'abbattimento dell'animale, perché la pelle ha origine dove appunto la stessa si crea dallo spoglio dell'animale nel momento in cui questo viene abbattuto. Quindi per noi il paese di origine è il paese di abbattimento dell'animale, da non confondersi con la provenienza commerciale o geografica di chi eventualmente va a vendere le pelli a una conceria. Questo per essere precisa più possibile sui, sui termini. Finisco qui la mia presentazione e poi eventualmente altre spiegazioni le daremo attraverso il panel. Grazie. going to just bin the presentation actually I might show you one or two slides but I'm not going to go through it because it's about 15 minutes and you said five and we're already behind so I'm going to do what I asked Stephen to do yesterday and just speed it up a little bit um, I think a lot of you already know about leather working group is there anybody in here who doesn't know anything about leather working group no okay cool so we can skip the introductions um, but what I will talk to you about is um, a little bit about what we were discussing yesterday. We had a, a member meeting yesterday. We had 150 people in attendance. As you know, we're cross-sector. So we had brands, suppliers, leather manufacturers, technical experts. We also had new associations in the room who are now associate members of the group. So we had a great cross-section. And we had a really interesting and I think really vibrant discussion on traceability, what it means, what brands want from traceability, why they want it, what their interest is, what their concerns are. And we had some instant feedback from um, some polling that we did on the day. And one of the interesting takeaways was that of the 150 attendees, those that responded to the poll, 89% said that LWG should do more to influence better traceability in the supply chain. Um, as Sabrina said, we, we also already have traceability in our, in our protocol and we take it back as far as the slaughterhouse and for the same reasons that Sabrina mentioned. Uh, we do have some additional criteria when we're looking at material in Brazil. 
Uh, we do ask for not just the detail of the slaughterhouse, but also the date of slaughter. And that material is stamped on the hide um, to provide physical traceability as well as uh, traceability by robust paperwork. In our protocol report and on our website, we clearly identify the traceability as a separate item. So you can see the exact percentage of material from around the world that's traceable through robust paperwork and physical marking or just with paperwork only. So it's, it's a one snapshot for a brand to take a look at and say, okay, I know that that material is 100% traceable or maybe they've got 50% traceable with paperwork and 50% traceable with physical marking. And physical marking can be anything. It can be a stamp. We saw a great presentation yesterday, actually, about um, laser marking. And it went right through the whole process and stayed intact. And the really interesting part for me was that it it actually puts the stamp on both sides of the hide. So when that goes through a splitting machine, the likelihood is you'll still have both parts with that mark on. I was late arriving today because I've just spent a day with the auditing team. Uh, we have 10 auditors around the world and they've all been together with me today for, for a session. And uh, we were talking about how we can uh, influence additional measures and what it means for them and, and, and how we can make a difference a little bit further. And I think that they're all agreed that for most regions, we can do more. For those regions of the world where there are slaughterhouses and, and industrial slaughter as we understand it, then we can do more. We can do more to influence our leather manufacturers to mark their material and to follow that provenance through the chain to provide that onward trackability. What we were discussing today was what we need to put on the hide. Because at the moment, our leather manufacturers, and we have about 575 uh, audited tanneries around the world right now. Um, and at the moment, we have a, a, a difference in what they put on their hides. Some just put their tannery stamp on. Some put their tannery stamp on and a mark that identifies the slaughterhouse. And I think another thing that Sabrina mentioned actually is um, this need for confidentiality and, and the supply chain doesn't want everybody else knowing where they're sourcing their material from. And it is important that for us, traceability is not about everybody else being able to see. We're doing that verification. So we have a system where our auditors have um, a dedicated page on the website which is only accessible by them and tanneries can choose to use a series of symbols and codes and numeric data that have a process and a procedure in place. And as long as they can explain that process to the auditor, and as long as we have verification from their supplies that this is the code that they use, then that's our verification. It doesn't have to identify the exact name of the tannery. It can be a series of letters and a series of numbers. And in fact, the slaughterhouse date always is a series of numbers. So we don't specify the mark they must use. We just specify what they must show on that mark. And actually, that was part of our discussion today. Are we going to say that everybody needs to say the tannery and the slaughterhouse in future? And one more thing before I finish, because I'm not going to rattle on for much longer, but it's important to remember that not all regions around the world can give us traceability. You know, India, Pakistan, Africa, there are lots of areas around the world where we will not get traceability. They don't farm in the same way that we do. There isn't industrial farms. They don't have slaughterhouses. So we have to be responsible in how we go about this, in doing what we can, the best way we can. And in those regions, maybe we have to look at other metrics. We have to look at other ways that they can demonstrate some form of good practice around their, their supply chain. So, but... Anyway, I will leave it there and feel free to ask questions. We'll be just here. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this, that was very, very, very interesting. Oh, you have to, to change the... For this panel, we are going to have a... A very simple question. So we have heard now what you are actually doing now. If you want to to expand a little bit further, you can you can you can do that. 
but my my question is going to be what are your goals for the future what are your expect how are you going to implement what the brands are or what the people in, in your in your survey uh, have asked you to do and uh, also Rafael Andrade or uh, Sabrina, what are your goals? What are your objectives for the next future? Yes, um, we're very optimistic about how we can implement in the future because one of the uh, advantages of um, CSCB, the Brazilian certification, is that it's run by the uh, CICB, which is the Brazilian Tenneries Association. And with the strength of the Tenneries Association, we are able to tackle the meat association, the milk association, all the agro uh, that are around this and, and make some positive changes for the future. It's already been done. Um, you've heard all the news that have been coming in the past weeks. And so the movement in Brazil is very strong now. And uh, the association, the board, is coming together in close with all the associations in order to create better uh, metrics, better uh, ways of collecting data uh, because the data is there. We have all, all the GTAs which uh, corresponds to the transport, the animal transport in Brazil, but we need to access all this this data. Laura knows what I'm talking about and Sabrina knows what I'm talking about. And the only thing is that we need to access and grant access to that so that we can give this information forward to the public. And one of the things is, is uh, Brazilian tenneries. You guys know, know Brazilian tenneries. Uh, the biggest tenneries uh, are, are located in Brazil. They're very professional. They, they, they work a lot. They're present in all the trade fairs around the world. So, but what we need is to do more. We need to go beyond legality because all the tenneries are legal. All the tenneries are doing their homework. Uh, uh, but CICB being on the verge of this change is tackling, is working with all the other associations because it has the power to. So the power of change comes from the association. That, that's my, my point for the future. Thank you very much. Uh, Sabrina? Dunque, eh, sul quanto abbiamo fatto, direi che siamo anche abbastanza soddisfatti di aver raggiunto dei buoni numeri di certificazione perché ci sono tantissime aziende che hanno già fatto queste Uh, questi schemi e almeno altrettante che lo faranno entro fine anno però al di là dei numeri abbiamo fatto un lavoro molto importante di diffusione delle conoscenze di questi schemi nei nostri distretti conciari presso i brand abbiamo fatto tantissimi incontri e attualmente stiamo andando avanti a siglare anche degli accordi di collaborazione con altri paesi europei per esempio oltre al Brasile con cui abbiamo già firmato l'anno scorso di recente intesa ci sono anche dei protocolli con Spagna, col Portogallo, proprio perché abbiamo intenzione di eh, favorire la diffusione della conoscenza di questo strumento e renderlo disponibile in tutti i paesi dove c'è necessità di avere trasparenza e tracciabilità. Ovviamente da un punto di vista tecnico tutti i nostri schemi sono, si sono evoluti perché dalle specie allevate poi abbiamo creato delle varianti per le specie wild, per le croste, e adesso stiamo lavorando agli sviluppi di questi schemi per quelle che saranno, tornando alla tua domanda di cosa farete in futuro, le integrazioni per queste analisi di rischio di cui dicevo prima. Cioè fino ad oggi non abbiamo mai fatto blacklist, ma è il momento adesso sia con l'appoggio dei nostri partner brasiliani di iniziare a affrontare il tema della deforestazione come degli studi universitari sull'animal welfare, di integrare questi eh, queste mappature delle supply chain con quelli che sono i gradi di rischio legati agli approvvigionamenti da certe aree geografiche. Quindi questo è esattamente il lavoro che noi stiamo già facendo o faremo con questi nostri collaboratori per dare queste informazioni alle concerie che ci hanno chiesto la certificazione, per dargli elementi aggiuntivi per valutare il grado di rischio legati alle proprie supply chain o a carattere animal welfare o a carattere ambientale, eh, uso del suolo, deforestazione sociale e quant'altro. Quindi questi saranno gli sviluppi futuri. Grazie. Deborah? Ok. Um, yeah, we, we have some specific uh, action plans going forward. Um, we've had three days of meetings now uh, amongst some subgroups, main members, auditors, 
and uh, we will be reviewing section four, which is our traceability section in the protocol. Uh, National Wildlife Federation will be helping us with that review uh, to see if it's still uh, doing what we need it to do and to see how we can strengthen it and if we can strengthen it, how we can do that without disengaging or disadvantaging other sectors um, of membership. So we will be looking at a number of things, whether or not we need to ask for increased requirements, whether or not it's time to link the traceability with the medal award for their environmental performance, um, whether or not it's just another add-on to that medal award if they can demonstrate 100% traceability, for example. So there's lots of things that we're thinking about. It's definitely on the agenda, and we'll be having some working groups. We'll be taking away all the information that we gathered yesterday. You know, I mean, we had some really good comments uh, and suggestions from the members that were present. So the first thing we'll do is do a more formal membership survey that goes out to the whole of the membership. Because obviously, we had 150 yesterday, but we've got like 750, 800 members now. So we'll be doing a full member survey with a lot more detailed questions and then we'll bring that back in and see what we can do to do what they're asking us to do, which is to influence uh, additional uh, uh, improvement in traceability. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, we are a little bit behind schedule, so uh, if there is one burning question in the room, we are going to take it. Otherwise, we go further. Well, then, applause. Thank you very much. I, I'm going to um, call now. We're going to come to a very hot topic now because it's uh, about uh, deforestation and land use change. And uh, for that, we have uh, an NGO that is here. Uh, uh, Mauricio Bauer is going to come to tell us uh, what they are doing in uh, uh, the Amazon. Fantastic. Uh, and uh, then we're going to have a panel also with uh, Rafael Andrade and Sabrina Frontini where there is also a, a, a work that is ongoing in order to find solutions to the pressing problems that we are facing. Mauricio, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I know it's the last presentation. It's, uh, it's hot, it's late. So I'll try to be as uh, little, as technical as I can. A little bit of a CV, my background, my former education. I'm a, I'm a veterinarian, I'm happy to know I have someone in there. And I'm an agronomist. Um, I made my career in the corporate sector, including a number of meat packers in the past, including JBS in Brazil, Australia, and the United States. Um, I then, about two years ago, three years ago, I changed that chapter in my career, opened another chapter working for an NGO, so I'm not an environmentalist. I am a corporate guy working for an NGO. I'm based in Washington, D.C., uh, and I work for the National Wildlife Federation. Um, the National Wildlife Federation, uh, full disclosure, we're not Greenpeace. There's, they're funded for a different reason. We are funded for other purposes. Uh, we work in a um, collaborative approach. So we work with the, with the industry, with the marketplace actors, trying to find solutions and um, proposing new ways for them to achieve their um, sustainable agreements or commitments. Um, we work in a pre-collaborative approach. So uh, com apologize. Pre-competitive, it's the jet lag. Pre-competitive -pre approach, so we believe that competition happens after what we work for. We work with all the members in the, uh, in the industry in sector-wide uh, or industry-wide transformation um, initiatives. Um, to the presentation. So the Amazon is back in the radar of the world. In the last few months, we heard again about the Amazon. Uh, the last time I think came th with that that much um, uh, strength was about 10 years ago. Um, what's happening and what are we doing about? So my presentation is not really necessarily about deforestation alone, but what is happening to um, to tackle this this problem. Um, the Brazilian Amazon is the largest uh, rainforest in the world, the largest in Brazil. 
um, about 30 million people live in there. It's just just over in Australia. Um, in the Amazon, which uh, the Brazilian Amazon is comprised by nine states in the northern part of the country. The Amazon biome is a larger uh, ecosystem. It spans over nine countries. Uh, the Brazilian Amazon has about 80 million heads of cattle in that region alone. Um, just so you have an idea of the extension of the Amazon, this is the U.S. low 48 states. Um, it's, it's a big challenge. We were listening uh, other uh, countries talking about their monitoring systems, and the challenges are significantly higher for Brazil. Uh, one of the states that we have, the Mato Grosso state, uh, it's not in that map, but I will show inside that state you can fit the UK, France, Denmark, and the Netherlands together. It's one and a half the size of Texas. This is one of the states. Um, current situation in the Amazon. Um, this picture is not like this. This is an enhanced picture. I put it there to... Um, scare you guys, but it's not like this. Um, oh, full disclosure, I had a presentation yesterday at the Letter Working Group, and some of the points that I'm going to make here are similar, and I apologize for the ones that were there yesterday. There, there's a reason for that. So, so this is an enhanced image that's not w how it is. This is. This is from this year. So there is a problem. Uh, they are burning the Amazon to put cattle on, to put soy on. This is from this year, and this is what's left after they, they slash and burn. Um, it's not the worst. It has been worse. So if you compare uh, to previous years, the, the number of, of fire hotspots from uh, January until August, year by year, you see we're not in the worst of the situations, but the concern is we don't want to get to a situation where we were in the mid-2000s. So something needs to be done about. Uh, there are reasons for the Amazon to be uh, burned. Nobody burns a forest because they don't have anything to do on a Wednesday afternoon. There are incentives in place, uh, economical incentives in place. And what we have to do is replace those incentives for incentives that are more environmentally uh, diligent. Um, there has been a change in the political scenario in Brazil over the last, say, 14 years. The administration, Brazil was under a government that was a little more liberal, uh, leaning left. And this year, it changed completely to a more conservative uh, administration, leaning right. And some of the actions of this administration, exactly to make a point to differentiate from the previous administration, was actually um, be less stringent about the environment. Um, I'm not here to talk about politics. It's just what it is. Leather. Um, what's leather had to do with that? We don't believe that um, leather is uh, the problem. We don't believe the tanneries are the problem. But we believe that the leather and the tanneries can be part of the solution of the problem. Um, so one of the solutions is to demand... Well, basically... The leather industry needs to know where your leather comes from. Who are the bad actors? Who are the good actors? There are good actors in place in Brazil. There are bad actors in place in Brazil, as anywhere else. And you need to know where your leather comes from. How do you do that? Um, we believe that the full traceability is key. So full transparency and traceability, so you can have visibility on your supply chain all the way to the birth of the, of the cow. Um, a little bit of, of just a quick profile of Brazil. We have 215 million heads, um, about 80, 80 million in the Amazon. 20% of Brazil's beef is exported, and 80% of leather is exported. Um, what would be our suggestion for requirements to obtain uh, deforestation-free leather? Just a little bit on the, the, how the, the, the leather supply chain, uh, the uh, cattle operation happens in Brazil. This is a, a little schematics of the, um, the beef and leather uh, supply chain. Um, in Brazil, you have from the meat packer 
upwards this, the, the, the supply chain. You have direct suppliers, which are the farmers that, the, the ranchers that supply the meatpacker directly. Very few operations in Brazil are fully integrated. So uh, the norm, especially in the Amazon, are a multi-tier operation. Uh, and then you have the indirect suppliers. And for the sake of this exercise, so you understand what I'm saying, I'm going to divide the indirect suppliers in tier one and tier two. Yeah? Um, bear in mind that the further up you go the supply chain, the more fragmented base are the, uh, the actors in place. Meatpackers are currently mandated either by law, mandated by law, or by the internal policies to monitor their, um, their direct suppliers. There are monitoring systems in place. You hire, they hire companies to do that, which are the service providers. And that covers about, talking about the first station in the Amazon, about 41%. You have visibility on 41% of the first station in the Amazon by monitoring the direct suppliers. If you add one tier, uh, further up in your monitoring system, which are the tier one indirect suppliers, you add another 48% of visibility in the deforestation in the Amazon. So by monitoring direct and indirect suppliers tier one, you have about 89 to 90% of the of deforestation in the Amazon. And this is pretty positive. Um, the remaining 10 to 11%, we believe it's like a uh, uh, an opportunity for future, and we believe that the market will naturally gravitate towards being monitored once you have the tier one uh, direct indirects and the, the direct suppliers monitored. How does it work? In Brazil, animals move from farm to farm, and what follows them is the GTA, the Animal, animal Transit Guide, which is basically a docket with information about, this is important, the GTA for the cattle industry in Brazil is a lot of animal, not individual animals, okay? This is quite important. Um, it has information about the, the species of the animals, the sex of the animals, the number of animals that are being transported, the, or, the origin property, and the, the destination property. This is about the farm. Each individual ranch in Brazil has a car, which is the environmental uh, registry is a data set, the property data set. So we have information about the boundaries of the property, the polygon of the property. You have information um, that correlates to the ownership, the social status. The GTA and the CAR are digitalized, government-maintained database of open access. Okay? Each individual Mitch Packers will have a CIF number, uh, which is a unique number uh, given to the meat packer. Uh, by by government and is related to the actual the physical facility of the of the uh, the processing facility. Uh, if a, a, a given facility changes ownership, uh, the CIF number remains the same. So it's not related to the ownership, but it's related to the operating status. Systems in place for traceability. You have cloud-based traceability tools that provide the meatpacking industry in Brazil with enhanced visibility into the supply chain, looking, linking lots of animals to supplying ranches. You have a number of market operators. Um, these are commercial companies that are hired by, um, by meatpackers to perform the, the, uh, the traceability and the monitoring of their supply chains. Um, Currently, none of those, except for VZPAC, which I'm going to talk about very briefly, currently none of those um, operators is able to trace to indirect suppliers. They stop their monitoring at the direct supplier level. Um, there is a need for you to monitor the full supply chain at least until tier one indirect suppliers. VZPAC is a tool developed under an initiative that we are in with other co-architects, including the WWF, uh, funded by the Moore Foundation, which is the philanthropic arm of Intel. And the system was developed with the University of Wisconsin in Madison that uh, cross-references um, the property data set, the animal transit docket, and a few other open government databases to give um, meatpackers uh, uh, enhanced visibility into their supply chain. Just a quick schematic, I don't want to be too long. 
so you have an idea what the car registration is. Once the, the rancher is um, registering their farm, it's much like a um, tax filing procedure in Brazil. You go putting information after information, screen by screen, and you can uh, delineate the polygon of your property in the map, including the mandate, uh, if this moves, this here. This is the mandatory um, natural visit vegetation area that every property, depending on the, the, the state, the percentage that's mandatory, this can be included in the car. And then when the government audits, they overlay maps after maps and see if there's any uh, land use change. This is um, the car to the property level, the far right and the middle one. It's an actual, actually a farm. It's color coded by depending on the the, the status of the, of the land. And the one on the far right is a municipality level. In blue, you can see the car, the farms. In red, you can see indigenous lands. In yellow, I think, are settlements. And in pink, on the middle there, it's a, it's a town. So it's a pretty interesting way of, of seeing how the, the properties are changing their, their land use. This is an animal uh, docket guide, just a quick information. Uh, you have uh, basically different fields that are filled in, including, uh, sorry, including here, this is a space for the rancher to draw its um, hot branding uh, mark. Uh, what VZPACI does, uh, it has inputs, so uh, animal transit guide, the property data set, and other open governments that are social um, in, in uh, protected areas, indigenous lands, endangered areas, slaver list. It's all fed into a, a very powerful algorithm, and this algorithm processes this information and spits out information that can give enhanced visibility to the, to the operator. Um, this is a good example, so meatpacker X, Y, and Z, and you have two SIF numbers, where two, two different uh, slaughtering facilities, A, B, and C, C, and D, and in pink, you can see their direct suppliers, in uh, blue, you can see their indirect suppliers, and in green, you can see the actual um, uh, the meatpacking uh, installation. And you can also overlay with maps, given the catchment area of the cattle, which is the radius of 300 kilometers in this case, I think, and the, the co vegetation coverage for each individual uh, SIF um, operator. Um, we were, um, oh, it's a big challenge, as you can see. It's a, it's a massive challenge. We're talking about uh, two million farms, we're talking about 215 million heads of cattle, and how can a beef operator or a, a, a leather operator have full visibility and security on their supply chain? About a year ago, um, ECHEC and CSCB uh, came to us and said, we want to raise the level of our visibility and our supply, supply chain, uh, uh, increase the governance of our, of our supply chain to make sure we can offer our members and our customers um, guarantees that our leather is, is, is safe to be bought. And deforestation free is the ultimate goal, and what's the way to get there? What's the roadmap? So we, we formed a formal partnership and we are collaborating together, incorporating uh, traceability criteria um, uh, language into their principles and criteria to in, in enhance their, their capabilities in terms of visibility in their supply chain and guarantees for the customers. Um, as far as, as I said, we operate in a pre-competitive space. This is one of the partnerships that we, we value very much, and we're, we're moving ahead with that very, very dil diligently. And I'm super happy to, to talk about it, I'm excited. I'm not going to go too much more into this. Um, these are some of the recommendations that we have for, for brands and, and tanneries to incorporate in their policies uh, to guarantee that their uh, traceability is uh, diligently enough um, in terms of, of sourcing. Um, there's more, obviously, and we're happy to, to talk more about that. Um, 
one final thought. Uh, we, we encourage uh, those brands that source leather from Brazil not to be restricted to the Amazon biome in terms of policies and, and procedures. We all, all biomes in Brazil are governed by legal frameworks. Um, another biome threatened in Brazil is the Cerrado, the Brazilian savanna, which is half of that is gone. They're cutting it to plant soy. Um, so governance, environmental governance on that is quite important. Um, our recommendation for brands and industry representative uh, platforms and organisms is when you abandon, when you cut Brazil from your supplier base, you are solving your problem, but not the problem. Uh, once, once a company leaves uh, Brazil, for example, or a biome, you create a temporary vacuum in the marketplace. And we know there's no such a thing as a vacuum in the marketplace. This, this vacuum is filled with actors that has less stringent policies and less uh, strong um, uh, governmental uh, policies. What happens is the, the cattle would not die in the farm. The cattle will be slaughtered, the beef will be processed, and the leather will be sold. The question is to whom? So we prefer that good companies stay on the ground and work with actors that are working with solutions from within instead of just abandoning the country as a, as a supplier in their supply base. Um, anything else that you can think of? Nope. Brazilians in the room? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry for so quick. Well, uh, thank you and thank you very much for your patience. Uh, we are a little bit uh, uh, delayed. I apologize particularly for Mr. Matelli who is waiting for, you, for giving his, his presentation. Just one question per uh, panelist so that we go through that uh, quite quickly. Um, it's a very important topic. It's a very hot topic and we see that uh, uh, ECEC, uh, I start with the lady first, of course, um, that ECEC is uh, collaborating and cooperating with uh, uh, Brazilian counterparts uh, uh, and with the uh, uh, National Wildlife Fund uh, Federation uh, to, to, to find solutions to that. Uh, my question to, to, to Sabrina is uh, how, uh, well, how does it work, actually, this cooperation, and uh, uh, um, what, uh, uh, how come that you are cooperating with, uh, with Brazil, because you are an Italian certification body? Allora, sul fatto del perché collaboriamo non sarei ripetitiva perché è tardi, ce lo siamo già detti, un anno fa abbiamo firmato un agreement con CSB, motivo per cui poi al di là dell'agreement abbiamo trovato esattamente idoneo questo come argomento su cui lavorare. Poi con NWF abbiamo aperto una collaborazione finalmente con una, con una ONG collaborativa non aggressiva, come di solito avviene da parte dell'ONG verso il settore pelle, quindi abbiamo trovato un partner ideale per rendere completo questo lavoro. Ci sentiamo molto sicuri e tranquilli di fare un buon lavoro anche perché tutto questo avviene con il supporto anche delle relative associazioni di categoria, quindi di UNIC per l'Italia, del CICB per il Brasile e ai tempi l'accordo era stato firmato anche sotto il cappello di eh, ICT, quindi dell'International Council of Tanner. Ma vorrei dire anche due parole su come funziona questo strumento di lavoro. Noi abbiamo un tool qui che stiamo presentando, infatti eh, questo panel eh, mi piacerebbe anche che eh, in, pochissimi, in pochissime battute possa dire ma cosa state facendo alla fine, dopo tutta questa teoria, questo strumento come lavora. Quindi siccome io sono la prima di questa filiera che eh, raccoglie le informazioni e le fa passare agli, agli altri attori, vi spiego brevemente cosa succede. Succede che noi andiamo nelle aziende italiane che comprano materie prime dal Brasile, chiediamo attraverso la nostra certificazione possibilmente o comunque in ogni caso di campionare dei lotti di pelli di provenienza brasiliana, ne campioniamo alcuni significativi per tutti quelli che sono i loro fornitori, quindi se hanno due, tre, cinque fornitori ne prendiamo almeno uno per ciascuno di questi fornitori e passiamo queste informazioni ai nostri partner brasiliani che hanno il compito di fare le indagini sui fornitori del Brasile 
e arrivare ad identificare quei nomi di macelli e i numeri di macellazione che poi servono al terzo partner NWF per andare ad interrogare i sistemi, per esempio Visipec, che fa appunto il check sui fornitori diretti e indiretti. A questo punto ci torna la risposta su quello che è il grado di rischio che ha quel tipo di supply chain con quei fornitori che abbiamo esattamente mappato presso le aziende italiane che sono interessate a fare questo tipo di controllo. Questo è il funzionamento molto semplice del, del tool, non posso aggiungere altro perché siamo sotto NDA, stiamo lavorando con delle aziende pilota, ma io spero che in sei mesi potremmo essere qui ad annunciare anche con queste aziende quelli che sono i risultati di questo progetto. Yes, in that way we can have a circle, a complete full circle about uh, where it comes from in Brazil until when it goes after in Italy. We have a full circle with this technology that with Visipac and with the collaboration of the tenneries from the Brazilian tenneries, collaboration of the Italian tenneries. So we have everything under NDA, so it's very interesting to see it rolling and pretty soon we're going to have some, some uh, developments to, to inform the public. Excellent. So you, you, this means that you can certify that the letter is not going to come from the forestation areas? It's a process in which we can uh, evaluate where it comes from and where it buys from, where the slaughterhouses buy from. We have everything from the slaughterhouses and we can track with the GTAs that were presented here, and we can uh, understand how much of that ladder, if it buys from some certain regions, uh, regarding on, on the batch, because it's based on batches and lots of ladders, uh, a percentage of, of how much of the ladder that that uh, tannery, per se, is, is completely free of, of risk of the forestation, right? Yes. it's. Um we're going to give enhanced visibility to the tanneries. That's, that's what it is. The decision as to whether or not we'll continue to buy or we'll work with them to curb deforestation from the current production is a decision made by the companies, by the tanneries, by the organizations. What we're going to provide is enhanced visibility so they can actually know where the leather is coming from. No, there's no decision being made by Visipac. Visipac provides information. That's, that's what it does, just to make clear. So, Mauricio, um, well, it's, it's, it's unusual that we have uh, an NGO collaborating with industry. That is, uh, we know that uh, normally there are very uh, contradictory uh, interests that are, that are there. How, how, was your, how is your experience with uh, working with the industry and trying to, to make the improvement happening actually on the field? Yes. Um, we're, we're quite happy. Actually, we have seen a lot of movement, out of, a lot of appetite from the industry coming to us asking for our expertise, and we can, we're happy to lend this expertise. We're funded to do that. Um, there's a lot of opportunities in Brazil. I was talking about Mato Grosso State, for example. The, the, there's a huge gap to be, to be um, bridged there. The, usually they raise 0 0.6 to 1 heads per hectare in Mato Grosso, and I know, being an agronomist, I know that 300 kilos of nitrogen, some fence, and little training, you can triple that. You can put four heads per cattle, three and a half heads per, heads per, per hectare. Um, the entire uh, soy demand for the last, next 15 years, both domestic in Brazil and international, fit within the degraded land of Mato Grosso State alone, 8 million hectares in there. So the opportunities are huge, and we see companies seizing from that opportunity and looking at Brazil as an important place to invest. And we're, we're here for that. We're here to collaborate. We're here to, to work with them in solutions. Um, we bring academia. We, we, we fill that gap that sometimes we feel is needed, translating the, the scientific data paper to the business people this, I believe this is the role of the, of the civil society, and that's, that's how we operate. We're answering your question. We're, we're quite happy with this movement in the industry. Thank you very much. Well, a last word by anyone of the panel? No? Fine. I, well, we, we will have afterwards a kind of cocktail that is going to be served in the other room. I, no? No? Not anymore. Okay, well, fine, sorry. Ah, it's not. Ah, it's, it's.
can you can you say explain Ponte di Mare? Well, okay, we'll we'll see it afterwards. Um, so please keep your questions if you want to have more information for any of the panelists so during the cocktail. You're going to be able to get more information. So a big applause to the panel. <laughs> and, and now, now the the, the last uh, uh, session, and I have the big privilege to. To, to welcome uh, with us uh, Francesco Matelli, who is uh, today here in his capacity of president of the chamber for the arbitration of hides, skins, and leather. Uh, and uh, well, it's a it's a big privilege because we we know each other for quite a while, and uh, we have always had very very good uh, uh, relations. So uh, I'm very happy that you took the time for being with us. Thank you, and I will try to be quick. Seeing uh, the time, I would like to thank, uh, anyway, uh, Linia Pelle, Unic, and Cotans for having given the opportunity to the Arbitration Chamber for Hides and Skins and Leather to be part of this stimulating workshop. We have heard very interesting presentations this afternoon, which confirm us that the, the awareness of the industry that we are in a phase of a structural turning point in our business, which will also set new rules. And I would like to take the opportunity, being the voice of uh, an institution which has been for over 80 years a bulwark for the respect of the rights and of the rules of this industry, to talk about quality standards in the delivery of raw hides and skins to the tanning industry. The reason for wanting to, to raise this subject has been also the observation that uh, with the dramatic drop in value of the hides and of the raw material, lately there has been a great looseness in the attention of the quality delivered to the tanneries. And this has created not only uh, an increase of commercial disputes, but it also has created costs in terms of efficiency in the waste management and an increase in labor and environmental costs. We heard how sustainability is a key factor in today's discussions aimed to give confidence to the consumers and but also to the, to the customers that leather is a sustainable product. But to really call leather a sustainable product, the whole supply chain starting from the slaughterhouse must meet the highest environmental and process standards. I don't want to bother you with too many examples. Let me see if I can switch, yes. With too many examples uh, on how uh, has been lost uh, uh, the actual standards of quality, but this is just uh, to give a small case which happened very recently in a delivery from one of uh, the main European slaughterhouses to a tannery. And this is regarding the waste which has been generated in leaving parts of, uh, of uh, the hide which normally should be trimmed off before being delivered, which if there had not been the attention of uh, the receiver of a tannery of trim off this amount of about 100 kilos of material, it would have generated uh, a much bigger waste in, if it had been processed with the addition of chemicals and needle trimming afterwards uh, and, uh, and all that. That's the reason why it's very important that this attention on the quality standards is not, uh, is not loosened. And uh, I wanted to take this case of improper presentation of the highs to recall that they actually there are quality standards in the, in the industry. And uh, we can see, we started from North America, where we have the standards governing the export of North American cattle hides uh, provided by the US Hides and Leather Association. We have in Australia, the Australian Code of Practice for Processing of Hides and Skins for Export. And we have actually in Europe, I don't, I don't talk about South America because it's primarily wet blue business, so it's more an internal 
I mean, I don't want to bypass Brazil, but, we, <laughs> but it's more an internal issue. But talking about Europe, Europe is Europe. And actually, we have in Europe, you know, st uh, still old uh, quality standards uh, which have been uh, primarily drawn in, uh, in the 60s or the 70s or later ones in the early 80s. Uh, which uh, uh, have not uh, always been extremely uniform uh, in terms particularly of, uh, of, of, of weight. We have in, Fran in France, uh, the non-Francais homologue, we have uh, in, uh, in the German, uh, which goes back to the 70s, we have the old uh, Accord Italia, uh, also in the mid-80s. But what I would like to recall to the members of the industry because uh, from a point of observation of the arbitration chamber we realized that actually very few members are aware that there is uh, in, in actually in, in Europe because they, um, there has been uh, sorry I forgot the Scandinavian agreement <laughs> which was also an old, uh, an old part uh, of the standards uh, of, of the industry but there is a European standard for leather, robovine hides and skins under the rule number 16055, which has actually been published already in 2012, which, uh, as I said, is not really properly known by the industry. And this is, uh, is, uh, is creating practically, as you can read in uh, point one of the document, that uh, it defines pretty well the terms and the definitions of, of what a hide is and uh, gives the rules for presenting raw hides and skins and applies to both fresh and cure material. And uh, so we can see it's pretty much detailed, but what there is one point missing. Here is, it gives a very good uh, explanation and definitions of the different uh, defects. Uh, gives also proper instructions for uh, the uh, proper cutting uh, of when opening the carcass in order to uh, optimize the utilization of, uh, of a hide. But what is actually missing is the criteria of classification uh, to really make it as a possible base for, uh, for the commercial agreements to be used uh, as a tool and then uh, user control. So, Actually, and I will quickly conclude, my, uh, and here actually is how the presentation of a high should be, so you see with all those parts which we saw in the picture, which should be, should have been trimmed off the high before being presented, uh, they, they, this is the standard which has been uh, uh, identified by the European uh, uh, Commission. Um, what is, uh, I think, important, seeing the fact that uh, we are missing the, the, the possibility of closing the circle with the whole criteria, is my invitation, I would invite Cotans to actually have a discussion with uh, uh, the uh, Ixalta and uh, with also the, the meat uh, associations to try to really create a document which can be used for commercial practices. And uh, um, I also would like to inform that uh, on the website of the arbitration uh, chamber will be anyway published all the standards in place right now so that it can be a reference for the industry to just be remembered how they are and the work which has been done. I thank you for your attention and want to take more of your time. It's been a long day. Thank you very much, uh, Francesco. Well, is, is there any question that you would like to ask uh, Francesco? No, thank you very much. Well. Yes, it has been a, a very long day and very informative day, very interesting day. And uh, um, I, uh, there, there is still one point on the agenda uh, that is going to talk uh, about uh, uh, specific uh, uh, height and skin improvement schemes that exist 
and that are ongoing because we are we're talking about uh, sustainability and partnerships and one of the partnerships that uh, I'd like to, to talk about because we, we were unable to secure speakers for, for that, but maybe it was a, a good thing because it's quite late now and so uh, I'm going to very, very quickly uh, speak about uh, the Spanish and Trefino uh, uh, lamb skin quality. Um, in Spain, there is a, a, a very particular breed of uh, uh, sheep. Uh, that is uh, providing an extraordinary quality height, uh, skin uh, for, for sheep. And, of course, we have seen uh, um, in, in the three countries that are uh, exploiting this raw material that uh, the quality has been deteriorating, and we were concerned about that. So we, we were, uh, uh, it was Italy, Spain, and, and France that were uh, um, coming together and speaking about uh, this issue and, and trying to find a solution about how we can actually do something for uh, uh, improving the quality of these skins. And uh, together with our suppliers in the Spanish and Trifino, in, in the Spanish sheep, uh, sector, we uh, ar arrived to identify a consultant that is going to accompany us through uh, uh, a journey, a journey towards elaborating some quality guidelines. And for that, so far, there have been hundreds of thousands of skins of Entrefino sheep that have been identified, qual uh, qualified, uh, 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 rated, etc. And we are about of setting a kind of traceability mechanism for, for that. So there have been quite a lot of improvement. You have uh, talked about the bovine uh, presentation, uh, uh, the, the, the standard that has been elaborated by, by the European uh, standardization body uh, that I'm uh, presiding, I'm chairing the, the, the technical committee 289 that is in charge of leather. Um, now we are likely to be coming very close to also a standard presentation of uh, four entrefino, entrefino skins. That, that would be also a, a very good uh, uh, output of, the, of this project. So um, we are not right there now, but we are actually working towards finding the identification of the, 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 the causes of the defects that are causing these uh, defects. There are a number of defects. Some of the defects are caused in slaughterhouses. Some of the defects are caused uh, during the, the, the farming and the feedlots. Uh, and therefore, we need to take some priorities. Well, the, the partnership has identified that before going any further into the livestock sector, we should be addressing the issues that, we, that can be addressed by the slaughterhouses through, through flying, flaying of the, of the animals. And that is going to be the first deliverable of, uh, of this project. So that is the Spanish and Trefino uh, Lambskin Quality Project. And uh, uh, I'm very happy to, to, to have uh, been able to communicate that about you. But there are also, this is a multi-country scheme. There are also some other schemes that are only national. And uh, in France in particular, there is a scheme to improve the quality of the, of the calf skins. But uh, it's also, there is also another scheme for calf skin that is improving in the, in, in the Netherlands. So there are initiatives ahead uh, uh, and that are going to bring good results. So it's uh, all about quality. Well, for, for finding a market and getting into the, the best niches of the, of the market, uh, heights and skins uh, must meet uh, some marketable possibilities. And uh, these are a reasonable price, a very good quality, a decent quality, but also some improved uh, appeal for the consumer. And that's why I think that we should be also working on uh, elements that are going to make sure that uh, uh, the leather has uh, again regains the appeal of the consumers by uh, finding also what is the the the, the correct allocation uh, of the environmental burden of the animal onto the skin. So um, I think that uh, it was a very long day. It was very informative, uh, very factual. And I hope that you are going to go back home with uh, 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 facts that you can then communicate uh, to your customers. Um, 
I would like to, to close. But uh, Luca, you, are you going to no. say a few words? No, I would just like to close the workshop. And I would like to thank you for, uh, for being here. I hope that uh, the workshop was useful. And uh, I would like to thank all the speakers and the panelists for uh, their presentation, for their presence here today. And um, we will have a cocktail reception, not in the, in, in the other room, but just uh, 200 meters on this walkway. On the left, uh, it's a cocktail uh, offered by Montebello Tannery, and there will also be a ballet uh, on the venue. So you are all invited to, to join us right there. And I hope you will join Lina Pelle for the next day. And if you have any need of information, any question about what we have heard today, please do not hesitate to contact us in Unich or Cotans, and I hope it can be useful for you. Thank you very much. See you. E non avrei graziato Gustavo, ma che vergogna. Siamo gli organizzatori, ci ringrazio. Debora, vai.